there, and welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies to dive headfirst into some nostalgia, or just get a little creative. So every month we select a different topic and create a top three list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, no spaces, or send an email to ScreenRefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three are, just to suggest future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, hosts Nick and Dean. Hello there. Hey, this topic is not near and dear to my heart, but I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> now let's get into rule of thirds, movies and shows that would benefit from a remake slash reboot. So this one a little bit different than our our last SNES Sega era games. Uh, I don't know if this one kind of affects childhoods too much. It's a little less nostalgia and a little more just kind of what stuff is good bones media wise. Um, I don't know. Did you guys have any trouble with coming up with some? I know when I was trying to think of ones that I feel would need to be remade, actually was a lot harder than I originally thought it was. I was trying to think of... Really? I felt this was extremely easy. Yeah, I didn't get that at all. Like, I was trying to think, and I was like, any of the ones I would think of that would need a remake or a reboot would just either be... would end up being, like, too obvious, like, oh, uh, Man of Steel should get a reboot. Like, they should do another Superman movie and just trash the Snyderverse and whatnot. Um, Do the Spider-Man treatment. Yeah. (laughs) Sell it to Marvel. (laughs) (laughs) you know the avengers and then all of a sudden (laughs) superman and batman show up is it too late to redo wonder woman 84 i enjoyed wonder woman 84 you're biased i know i mean this is i quit this podcast i'm done have a good night everybody (laughs) that's a fine i tim like my first question i think once i saw this plot start unfold was like is is why was this was this did they already reach the bottom of the well for wonder woman content like why this story so that story was a mishmash of a couple things in the comics if i recall um maxwell lord didn't have wish powers he had like mind control stuff um and i think this came to a head either during or just before uh, there was a, a limited series called Infinite Crisis, I think around like the mid 2000s um, of a bunch of wacky stuff that was going on. But one of the things was essentially at the end of that movie, where instead of Maxwell Lord being on camera and then having her like make everybody rescind their wishes of, well, spoilers for Wonder Woman 84. I'll have to uh, put at the <laughs> preface at the beginning of this. Um, I don't think anybody's going to be too... So yeah, so instead of asking everybody to rescind their wishes, they didn't have the wish thing in the comics. Um, So she just broke his neck. And that evidently (laughs) rescinded that wish. Uh, Yeah, so I thought that's the direction they were going with. I would have loved to have seen that ending. Uh, Overall, like, I I ended up enjoying it. I I enjoyed the first movie. Just I think it, it started strong and then... By the third act, it just became kind of a mess. But like, it had some really bad oh, yeah, moments. Definitely. And I was disappointed. I was disappointed the uh, metal guitar version of her theme didn't make its way back into '84. I mean, '84 height of metal. Like, wh- and then you're not going to use her sweet ass theme when she's kicking ass. I hate her theme. What the? Oh, I love it. Oh, it's one of the best. It gets me because jazzed. it's a cool riff. Oh, it's so and good. They just don't know when to place it in the appropriate moments. Oh, I don't have a TV. <gasps> well, I have a great relationship with Sears. I can get you a brand new TV by the end of the day. It's like, oh, she's getting a bagel from the, the fridge. No, like, come on. And I, Wait, what? That didn't well, happen. No, but I, that's the best analogy for it. Because they keep playing it over the dumbest things that she does. And I feel like we don't hear the I Captain America theme was... every single time he does it, like everything that he does. They'll save it for specific. Are you talking about the first movie? I'm talking for both. 
Oh, the second one. Actually, I honestly, I, I only, I heard, fell asleep through the second. I only heard one. it once. I didn't finish watching it. I couldn't. I only heard her theme once, and I knew it was like, oh, it's there's no metal, there's no sweet. Yeah, guitar. like I know you guys didn't love Wonder Woman eighty four. I preferred it over the first one. I just, I'm sorry, but like a nineteen twenties thirties pilot doesn't go into the Smithsonian being like, I can fly one of those, and then on top of the fact that plane is functional. A functioning military jet with gas. Like, it's not only functional, but the damn thing has gas in it. And then on top of that, like, what are those? Fireworks. Oh, gee, I've never seen any of those in my entire lifetime since we've had fireworks since the 17 fucking hundreds, at least. It's in our fucking national anthem. And then what does he do? He goes into it. Like, that's when I fell asleep. Because I'm like, all right, the rest of this movie can't get any more ridiculous than that, so... So I, I thought he flew a functional jet or jet plane. It was a, a modern one, I thought. Yeah, right. Which is that we talking which about? Which also, how does he know how to pilot a modern one? Right, because that's a that's a jet engine thrust. That's not. But I feel like he, I will give you all of those points. Also, all of the scenes <laughs> of her flying through the air, lassoing lightning. Okay, she did that. <laughs> yeah, but, but oh yes. So that happens later in the film. Um, so, I mean, the whole thing kind of goes by rule of cool. So was it amazing in terms of was there nothing you can pick apart? There's stuff you can pick apart. I still had fun with it. <laughs> I didn't feel like I saw online and everybody's like tearing it apart like it's the worst film of all time. Tim, you're biased because you like the comics. It's OK. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of movies. You could, with it's completely that I don't like. okay. I mean, uh, that's fine. I know, like a lot of the Star Wars stuff, <laughs> I kind of turned a blind eye to, and I know some of it's a little awkward to watch. But it, I'll be, I'm the middle ground because I don't read, I don't read any of that stuff. Um, I, I think I just, I, I enjoyed it while I was watching it, and. But immediately after it was over, I was just left thinking, like, oh, did I really like that? Or did I just, did I want to see the whole movie of, of uh, Chris Pine discovering the modern world? I'd rather. That stuff gets me. That stuff, that kind of stuff gets me. I could just watch a whole Chris movie. Chris Pine and Thor crossover where both of them just see things for the first time. <laughs> exactly. And Captain America. Yeah. And they're just like, whoa, what is this? Just a web series of the three of them as roommates. Then they discover porn on the internet, and then they just never come out of their room. I can do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Steve would do it. He's too much of a goody-goody. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he, he'd experience that kind of temptation in the in the forties. It wore different so, times back then. So I think, yeah. So I will we'll put a nail in the the Wonder Woman for now. I think the main thing is. <laughs> For good. It's not, I don't think it's deserving of the hate that it's getting at this point. That people are like tearing it down. People are saying that they should never make another Wonder Woman, that they should retcon that one entirely and take it out of there. It's like, it, it, let's not go that far. It's not that bad. I will probably at some point rewatch it again. Um, DC's problem is, is they're still trying to catch up to Marvel's huge momentum and they're cutting corners. That's all it is. If they were to take their time and continue on with the same trend that they had with the first Wonder Woman, they'd be a lot further along. But because they can't make up their minds and they're just run by, you know, money hungry studio executives, they won't get it right ever. What's the next Marvel um, DC Universe movie that's coming out? Don't say Batman because it's. I don't think that's affiliated. I think Suicide Squad, the James Gunn version. Yeah, we'll see how well that goes. But I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure they're, they're little, gonna literally cut. stealing from Marvel's playbook yeah. there. So it'll probably be decent, but let's see how else it goes because they're not using any of the A-list characters in that, are they? I mean, they have put Harley Quinn front and center. Um, they're using Polka Dot Man. <laughs> <laughs> that's who i wanted to be when i was when i was younger yeah so i'm glad he's children's getting, halloween favorite getting, getting polka sure. dot man um no like i think i think it's to me it's more interesting that they're pulling from like the c and d list characters to be able to do something with it because otherwise you come into it with a lot less expectations when it's a character you're unfamiliar with that you grow to 
like throughout the movie as opposed to this one's about Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman. Well, I have 30 years of history with all of them, so it kind of gives me some preconceived notions on what I'm going to be expecting. Well, do you know how... I think that's why Guardians of the Galaxy was so popular, because they, the, the, the public at large had no idea who these characters were, and they could... I know it's James Gunn again, but he could really make it his own thing and nobody had expectations about it except the niche comic book readers and yeah there were no expectations on that and i think that's yeah one of the reasons it, it was more easily digestible and was like yeah this is a great action comedy it's also a comic book movie but yeah because it's much did more you enjoy it as a, a a movie first and then right. a comic book adaptation yeah i think yeah. that's dc's problem they look at it too much like it's a comic book adaptation we have to be faithful but they don't actually st- take a step back and think like, is this even a good movie to watch? Like Suicide Squad was a train wreck. They try to do way too many different things in order for them to try to make everyone happy. But in turn, it just destroyed the film so that if you were to remove the fact that this is a DC movie, no one's going to see it. And you don't want that because you want to be able to sell it to anybody. So because it's a DC movie, that's the only way they were able to even market the thing. I will say that I, I know we're getting off the rails here, but I did enjoy the Harley Quinn movie and I didn't even watch Suicide Squad just because it reputation preceded it. But uh, I don't, I guess it seems like I didn't need to, but I thought that was a fairly solid movie. Yeah. Kind of picking up the Deadpool slack, like, oh, Deadpool is an R-rated action comedy. We can, maybe we can do that too. And I think it was definitely an enjoyable kind of romp for me. Agreed. Yeah. As far as the DC property, I think they they did a made made a solid. It was the original. most grounded in reality one I felt too. I'm trying to think. It's been it's been a while since I've seen it. That was like last year, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think. February. Um, man, that was. I was to say, <laughs> it, feels it feels like, like ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> it might as well be two years ago. Yeah. Right. But I, I can't remember if it did have anything like really out there. Like Suicide Squads, you know, like was she considered a god or like some kind of otherworldly oh, entity? Yeah, like yeah, it didn't some have sort of supernatural entity. I don't think she had magic, I, or rather, I don't think there was any magic or anything supernatural or just like overall like blatantly sci-fi or this would never exist in the real real world thing. It was just pretty natural. Yeah, I mean, it? other than Black Canary having the canary scream. Oh yeah, that she was like that one out. scene towards the end. Yeah, I'll I'll give that a. I'll give that a pass because that wasn't like plot like centric or um, like that didn't carry the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm interested in seeing what else they do with it. Like at the end of the day, I'll watch any of them um, just because that's my nature. Um, They've also been doing good with the, the animated Harley Quinn that's now on HBO Max. You guys have ever seen that one, but that one's Mm, funny as well. That existed. It's a very, are animated series um but it's more in line with what you expect from the the harley quinn movie so it's like modern uh multicolored ponytail yeah. harley quinn she starts in i think the first gotcha. episode as the the classic one and then does a, a makeover a makeover so okay so overall it sounds like you guys didn't love wonder woman 84 uh um, reboot <laughs> i agree with you that it's 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 it probably doesn't deserve the f- all the flack it's getting but it's just it was a very middle no yeah i don't like completely bashing stuff i really don't and everything that we've reviewed in the past there is a fine line that i like to draw and i will poke fun and it's more of like a big disclaimer it's just when billion dollar enterprises like warner brothers universal you know all the big big names there's a certain bar that has to be set That, of course, when it comes to their production quality, yes, they're going to go above and beyond when they can because they're pouring a lot of money into these things. So when it comes to like acting, cinematography, lighting, like all of that kind of stuff, if that's not there on a bare minimum, like it's not even worth watching at that point. So when it comes to the studios, they're always going to have that. So me ripping apart 
Wonder Woman is nothing against, you know, Gal Gadot and Chris Pine and all of them. They did a fantastic job with what they were able to do, but it was the powers that be that directed them and not also a target at specifically Patty Jenkins, because I'm sure with something as like in the spotlight as this, I'm just more pointing it more so at like the distributor and making sure that like, you know, come on, guys, there's certain things that like you shouldn't just be so blind and like, yeah, let's do this. Like, can we think it through a little bit more? Yeah, like corporate hands in the pot. Yes, that's that's really what it boils down to is like, you know, was Wonder Woman a bad movie? No, absolutely not. Dean showed me Troll 2. That was a fucking bad movie. (laughs) Yes, that was. I still wish I can get back those two hours of my life. They're eating them, then they're gonna oh, eat me. <laughs> very enjoyable two hours. They're eating her. And then they're going to eat me. Oh my god! Like, that was a legitimate bad movie. But in terms of Wonder Woman, it's just the expectation there should be a certain bar that's set that if you're not able to meet it, then it's, uh, you know, you're defiling the name of Wonder Woman. And I feel like this movie definitely did. You heard it here. We are champions of women's equality in Wonder Woman. And we don't tear down the movie based on that, based on it's it's just badly made. Or, you know, not yeah, I, th- not I think a big made. thing, as Nick said, even with like the previous movies, even like outside of the podcast of us just talking movies, We can poke fun at things. We can analyze and pick things apart, see where things like don't make sense or a little ridiculous. But at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't like it or we think it's not worthwhile. It's that kind of stuff that makes it entertaining for me to come back and talk about like, I will talk about Troll 2 in 20 years from now because... It will always make me laugh and it always still entertains me. So job well done. I won't be. I won't be. I know. You're not wired that way. I mean, it's simply put, like, (laughs) if it's bad, we're not going to talk about it. Or, like, we're not going to have an episode centered around it. So the fact that we're talking about any of these is, like, it means that it did affect us in such a positive way that it's worth bringing up. Like, I like Wonder Woman a lot. And I'm upset that it just, it didn't, you know meet that uh expectation yeah which i feel kind of bad because i it's granted there's stuff that i will still agree doesn't make sense but i think also once it started rolling on how much people hated it it started becoming an easy target for everybody on like social media to just take a pot shot at wonder woman 84 then i'm wondering if even half of the people that i'm seeing like blast it on twitter and forums actually saw wonder woman 84 or if it's just i know that's the trending thing right now is to tear this movie down so i'll do it because people are going to think it's funny like so ghostbusters it, i liked ghostbusters i don't see oh, what the, the big deal was the reboot one yeah it wasn't great it wasn't groundbreaking but you know what for a movie they hit all the marks and the only problem i think i had with it was what's his name Gabe from The Office, I can't stand him. His whole bit in the beginning, I it was like pulling my teeth, but all the rest of it was perfectly it. fine. They tried, and they had fun with it, and you can tell they had a lot of fun, and it translated pretty well, I thought. So I think speaking of the the Ghostbusters reboot and the discussions on if the the new Wonder Woman was worth a, a remake or whatever the case is, um, that kind of brings us into our topic that we started 20 minutes ago. We can, let's end this mini episode on Wonder <laughs> Woman 1984. So thank you for joining us on uh, screen refresh. So the, this is the movies and shows <laughs> that would benefit from a remake reboot. So now that we're, we're primed and ready to go. Um, does anybody have top of the order? Number three, uh, what is the, a movie or show you guys feel would make use of a reboot or a remake that uh, might actually work well for it. Dean. My first topic of discussion would be drum roll. Well, the property itself. Ender's game. The aliens nearly destroyed us. We need minds like yours. Ender. Because of you, the invaders might leave us alone. Is there more us? No. There's another way. Their thoughts, my dreams, all mixed together. Enter! It's not safe! We can't lose him. That's all that matters. 
it's no longer a game. Ender's Game, rated PG-13, in theaters and IMAX November 1st. Ooh. Specifically, the 2013 uh, movie starring Asa Butterfield and Harrison Ford and Haley Steinfeld and I think maybe some other So I take it you read the book? That are notable. <laughs> so, so I take well, it you've, re- you've read the book series? Yeah, I read the book a long time ago. It's one of the few books I would read. I think probably it was recommended, but I have a weird relationship with books now that I love to read books, but I feel like I'll only run out and get something if I hear there's like a movie coming out or a show coming out about it or somebody's like, it, it has to become popular and then I'll go and, and find it. I don't just kind of seek out new things to read. But in any case... I did read. These are one of the books that you I do read. Do audiobooks what? at all? Because no, I've actually like, never. I done grew up on Ender's Game and loved it. So recently, I was going to reread it, but instead, like, I try to find audiobooks that way I can listen to it while I'm doing other things. And they have a um, a normal audiobook version of Ender's Game uh, that I found on Audible, but then they have another version that's a like a full cast doing it. So everybody is doing different characters as like an audio drama. And it's a fun one. That one's good, too. So, I mean, it's one of those things that if you're ever looking to revisit it without having to, like, sit down and break open the book, it's nice also. That's a great point. I always forget, uh, since I've never done an audiobook, I, it, it's never in the forefront of my mind as far as something I could be doing versus, yeah, listening to a podcast. Although I love podcasts. I should probably bring audiobooks into my life. Maybe I'll start with that one. Having a uh, diverse voice cast is cool too. Cause I think generally it's just a, a narrator might change his voice slightly to, you know, become women or, or just not even change. Yeah, his like voice you, you have all. some good ones that will do at least like four or five voices. So it's like varied and it works well. Other ones, like I know, I think I was listening to Steven Weber do it. And Stephen Webber is terrific, but it's like he doesn't have to do voices. He just reads it straight or like Will Wheaton doing right. Ready Player One. So it's as long as they make it work, I'm fine with it. But it was definitely fun having a, a full cast. I think I'll definitely seek that out. You'll have to link me up. Unless it's just the only audiobook there is. Audible, no, yeah, sponsor I can, us. I can, sponsor us, Audible. Sponsor us, Audible. If you actually start an Audible, Dean, I think I can share a book with you as far as like a, a trial thing. Um, so I can always share that book with you for free so you can check it out. Do you have a code or listeners? And then I, d- you, I you don't. Get like Amazon. For like Do you own Amazon. Audible? <laughs> <laughs> Email me at screenrefresh at gmail.com. Get us that. Uh, so for people unaware of Ender's Game, Dean, what is Ender's Game? Ender's Game, a movie with Harrison Ford, and a well, it is a movie, but I guess the story is a child who was a third uh, in his family on Earth. They in the future, it's a futuristic kind of setting. Um, they limit uh, children to two. You can't have more than two children. It is illegal. But in Ender's family's case, he's uh, has like brilliant parents and the government has like tapped them essentially they feel like his th- their children one of them is supposed to be the quote unquote chosen one that is going to help them defeat this uh alien race that had in years prior like 50 years i think or or less before the story starts had kind of really fucked up planet earth badly before they could fight them off um so they tapped into uh, these children that are like geniuses and Ender is one of these really smart kids and they're kind of raising them uh, in military school to prepare to for when these aliens will one day return. So uh, Ender is kind of this kid that they are, it seems like humanity is, is placing all their hopes on to be smart enough and brilliant enough to save them and, and command essentially the all of Earth's forces against this alien race. So that's kind of the the setup for why he gets drafted in the military school. And, and the story kind of just covers his training and experience and coming of age. I think he's I think like, like 12 or something. I think he's like 12. Yeah, like 12. Yeah, because I think he's like 12 because I think Bean 
is like second in command is supposed to be like the tiny one he's like nine young. or something yeah um side note they he later wrote a parallel book called ender's mm-hmm. shadow which is from bean's perspective and goes off on its Which own. I liked on its own. I liked book that series. series better than the continuation of Ender's Game because they did Ender's Game. Then I think it was Speaker for the Dead and Xenocide. Right. And that one Xenocide. gets a little too philosophical, political for me. It definitely. It's it's it. It would be interesting if they. I guess the point is that the movie that they made out of this. I feel like now that because HBO is so hires really talented people and does such a good job with their series, except for, you know, <clears throat> we won't talk about in case, it. In case we get sponsored um, someday by the house of a dragon. <laughs> um, they, I, I feel like I want everything that's like a novel to just become a short series. I guess Netflix could, is kind of showing that it's got quality stuff too, as far as their limited series. Um, but I would want this to be made into an HBO series because it's it's a lot. Lots of books are hard to condense down into two-hour movies, but this one especially is very cerebral. Orson Scott Card um, said himself that like this, you can't film this because the whole thing is really in Ender's head. Like it's there's so much internal monologue that the essence of the book is going to be lost if you can't see that. But I think with enough time. Um, in a series like a, a 10 episode or an eight episode yeah, you have some breathing room limited series yeah you could really explore a lot of the heavier themes that are going on in this and the movie was pg-13 and not that it needs to be r but you could have a heavy pg-13 movie but there could be really dark moments that he's going through in military school and like literally he kills a kid and <laughs> it's very heavy and so it's yeah yeah he like kills him in the shower um that is you know i mean that's kids in the shower fighting like i don't know how you can space lord of the flies the in the pg-13 is that what you're asking for? Yeah. yeah it's very lord of the flies that's a good point Would yeah, you say it's probably best <laughs> never mind <laughs> but I, I just feel like there wasn't you know they, they were like let's it's it's not, i don't think it's a young adult novel i think it's it's i think they tried to make the movie like a young adult yeah i think the issue thing. isn't that they made it pg-13 it's that they pitched it to a pg-13 crowd which it's right. more like the horrors of war and all of that yeah and it's like at, i mean granted like i read it young and i ended up it clicked with me and i ended up loving it but it's like I wasn't the demographic, I guess, for it. It's just luck of the draw. I happened to find it one day at a library. Um, I guess the military actually recommends this book at certain levels. Oh, of, the Space Force? Uh, service. <laughs> the Space Force. <laughs> yeah. So what's it like up there? Have you ever read Ender's reading. Game? No, but I saw the movie. Good enough. Get on the ship. But there, there, <laughs> It's just a lot about morality, and the kid is 12, but he... You know, you gr- it's growing up fast, like having your childhood ripped away kind of to like, oh, you have to save humanity. And it's like, do I really, can I do that? Do yeah, I it's really like, do I do identify that? with that humanity at this point? <laughs> right, but I won't spoil anything, but he's just there training to do all this stuff. Um, but it, it's, it's much larger than that. And I just think... Uh, a series would do this a lot better because it was a it's a really cool story and I think just I feel like nobody saw it I think I I, I I think it flopped I didn't look up the numbers but I know it wasn't received well and they didn't try to do anything else with it although like Tim mentioned it's the the, the sequel after this jumps forward like years into the future and Ender is like a totally different drive in life where he's like a speaker for the dead that um, essentially tells people's stories, warts and all, at their There's funerals a... after gathering lots of information. And it's not really like space fighting anymore, although they're, they're alien yeah. races. but it's Now he feels totally responsible for the death of like the Formix and whatnot, so it's a lot right. older and a lot uh, jaded Ender. So 
yeah so it's like oh what could they make a whole series i don't know because it's like it 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 takes a sharp turn after the the first story but in any case i think the whole first book could be a cool limited series on netflix or hbo i think now it would properly have the time to give it the light it deserves because it came out during that period in the studios where Twilight did amazingly well and they're like what else can we do from a young adult standpoint that probably could make us money and that's when we saw Divergent, Hunger Games um, Maze Runner what else came out this one and it all seemed to come out all within like one or two years from each other and I think that Mm -hmm. Ender's Game was probably the most expensive out of the whole lot and because of that they probably had a sacrifice a little bit in order to tell that cohesive story percy jackson's another big one and um right i think they're gonna try to redo that one too i don't know I it was a hit stage musical anyway <laughs> yeah <Is> it really <laughs> i only saw the first one that. but i think there's a lightning thief and i don't know poseidon's fury and also for yeah, I reckon. I was gonna say also for anybody aware, as far as the reason for the budget thing is, when Dean mentioned um, Ender's at military school, Battle School is a floating space station where they do all their training up there, and then they conduct like war games of going into a zero G room and do like a freeze tag type thing with guns as units. So it's it's a little more involved um, for anybody unfamiliar. Yeah, it's like West Point in space, but with <laughs> zero G war okay, games. Yeah, cut it, print it, put it on the trailer poster. <laughs> it's West Point in space. You guys saw? Uh, <laughs> wait, not Small Soldiers. What was the? Uh, was it Toy Soldiers? I think where the uh, the military school. Did not. No idea. Child's Play Three. Child's Play Three. Look who's stalking. A haircut ain't regulation, soldier. Regulate this! (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Don't jump on that grenade. It's Child's Play 3 in space. (laughs) Yeah, but I recommend uh, reading that book and any of those books in that series I I think you'll enjoy. And definitely... It, it deserves it deserves a better treatment on the screen, and I think it's which possible. I know. So for anybody that doesn't really like wanted more of the, um, the thriller aspect of it and the the military aspect as opposed to like Speaker for the Dead and the ones going in that direction, as Dean said, they have a parallel one. So one of his second command, Bean, gets his own book called Ender's Shadow, where it's his life leading up to Battle School, and then it runs parallel with Ender's Game. And then he got his own spinoff series that was Shadow Puppets and sh- I think Shadow of the Hegemon, which continued his time back on Earth, getting involved in all of like this. Yeah. Like political turmoil. Yeah, because it, we're like children. Children are like controlling, <laughs> like controlling yeah, uh, cause, countries. Because the whole thing basically. is like all these different countries send all these kids up into space for this battle school thing. And after the war is over, right. they come back to Earth and all these different nations are trying to snatch them up as their military leaders because it's, hey, you've been training nonstop by all the best minds, so you are now going to lead our country to, like, war or something. So it's... Yeah, it's really... It's it's interesting stuff. So, it's yeah, like, that would actually be amazing if they were to do, like, even Ender's Game as its own, se- like, a season, so they can do, like, a book justice in, like, 12 episodes or something, and then... Each season after be a different one of those books would be fun. Also, I will say Orson Scott Card's views are his own and do not reflect that of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's been a massive disappointment to grow up with this book series as one of my major sci-fi influences. And then later find out the author's very problematic and backward stances on race and homosexuality. Like, I know it's tough to separate the artist from the work, especially when you have to consider that separating them and still purchasing their work continues to support them. Um, so I don't seek out any new work that's been done. So if you want to avoid supporting the author because of this, you can always pick up a used copy or check it out from a library because the story itself is a great read. He just, he's, has, he's Mike Pence on homosexuality. So it's, it's not, it's not a great look. 
But just separate that from the from uh, the books, because I don't think that element of his beliefs bleeds into it. But yeah, and this game number three, movies and shows that need a remake and reboot. What do you got? I have chose Disney's Gargoyles. Ooh. <sighs> 1,000 years ago, superstition and the sword ruled. It was a time of darkness. It was a world of fear. It was the age of gargoyles. Stone by day, warriors by night. We were betrayed by the humans we had sworn to protect, frozen in stone by a magic spell for a thousand years. Now here in Manhattan, the spell is broken, and we live again. We are defenders of the night. We are gargoyles. Stone by day, warriors by night. (laughs) <laughs> this was Disney's answer to Batman the Animated Series because everything up to that point from Disney was cutesy, anamorphic creatures that can speak. So they needed something a little more mature for the gr- their growing audience of age because they're no, they don't want to just cater to the kids because all the kids that are older are going to be wanting to watch the Batman show that's on Fox. So they decided, you know what, let's make our own thing. They decided to make a drama um, animated show compared to their usual happy-go-lucky stuff. And it worked very well. Oh, yeah. It had a relatively dark tone, uh, complex story arcs and melodrama. So um, a lot of it... You know, I notice nowadays um, a lot of shows don't try to give, like, the life lessons that the 90s stuff used to do. Like, I remember, um, like, what's her name? Not Stephanie Tanner, but one of, like, the older sister in Full House when she experimented with, like, smoking. And that was the oh, whole... Oh, DJ? This, yeah, this whole big thing. Or, um, you know, I'm sure uh, Family Matters had a couple of episodes, too, like that, where... You know, someone wanted to do something like, oh, no, that's bad. You can't be doing that. And then they get caught. And then the whole life lesson is there. And within like the first three episodes, Gargoyles, they have like a huge anti-gun thing where one of the main characters shoots um, their cop friend. And since they're Gargoyles, they're going to have to hide from the public and make sure and make it look like an accident. But, you know, the whole time he feels guilty, he almost killed his friend. And you don't really get to see stuff like that now. And it just shows on how dark this show did get, even though it was trying to show a positive message. Elisa, it was all my fault. I was playing with your gun and it went off. I'll never touch a gun again. I should have been a lot more careful about where I left it. We both made mistakes. Yeah, but you nearly paid for those mistakes with your life. Then let's not repeat them. The whole show in itself was just very well written, and even the first three episodes are considered a movie. So if you were to try to just start watching it and like you just would sit and watch the whole thing and it shows their origin from being in like the oh what year was it like yeah medieval, medieval times, times and then they get a spell cast on them to be stone gargoyles until their castle that they protected rose above the clouds and a millionaire who funny enough pretty much half the cast of star trek the next generation is on the show so um when was that Jonathan yeah, Frakes? When billionaire um, Xanatos decides, you know what? Let me see if this whole thing is real. He has the castle erected and put on top of his skyscraper, and sure enough, that's exactly what happens. In the first three episodes, shows like um, their reintroduction into modern society. They're been trying to find their place in this whole world, discovering who their friends and allies really are. Uh, an amazing show, and even though. They did make comics that kind of persisted the storyline through um, up until, like, I guess the late 2000s. Um, It would be nice to see them return to the 
I mean, it'd be cool to see them on the big screen, but at the very least, like make it a show again, but do a live action take on it this time around and see what they're able to do. I think like, especially now they're at a point where they can easily do like a small screen version of it that still would look fine CGI wise or like CGI practical mix. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that would be, I would love to see that. I just realized I forgot Keith David was Mm -hmm. a Goliath. Mm -hmm. His lovely voice. They are fascinated by the things they see on the television. Every night they rush to turn it on. But welcome to our home. Do you know if it's on Disney Plus now? It is. Oh, I have to give it a rewatch. Ed Asner was also a voice on this show. Is he, uh... Hudson. Hudson, uh, I don't rec- I don't recall Hudson. He was I the, hadn't watched the, the brown show one with the bad eye, time. I think, and the beard. I hadn't watched this. I honestly haven't watched it since I was a kid. Um, so I don't recall too much about it, but I know that theme... <laughs> That theme resonates, the opening. Uh, nah, 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 very, nah, 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 it's very nah. Disney. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. You could probably throw that in there and it'd be pretty badass. Um, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. The gargoyle's opening. It's, it's very Disney, tone. but it, it's it's very cool. My, the alarm. Yeah, the alarm that it's I set when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I had no, I mean, I, I remember from our, you know, first episode, you discussing gargoyles, but I didn't know it was that big of an affinity. Oh yeah. Like it. it's, it's a cool show. I know it's yeah, well regarded. I, um, it's kind of neck and neck with that and, um, Batman for me because they came out at the same time. So when, if it wasn't Batman on TV, I was making sure to watch this and I like Batman a lot, but this had just as much of an effect on it in my uh, younger years as Batman had done. So, yeah, which I feel like both of them, like Gargoyles, it would be cool to get a reboot or a remake just so we can get like a live action thing or see like that come back. But even aside from that, like definitely worth revisiting that and Batman enemy series, they can just throw back on streaming or throw back on TV. And I think it would still do well with no change. Yeah, it still keeps up. That's one of the problems, like, when we did our first episode and I tried thinking of like, what's some of the older shows I can watch to kind of, you know, get me back in the mindset or like, you know, I'm an adult now, let me rewatch things to see. And as an adult, some shows just you can't do it, man. Like huge turtle fan. I can't, I cannot watch the original turtle cartoon. It's way too, uh, <laughs> I've actually started to watch them and I, I, I do, I guess we'll agree to disagree. It's, I can watch them for what they yeah. were and realize that it's like, it's really for young, young yeah. kids. But I mean, I I get that. Um, it, it's just a nostalgia that, trip. Cause like that it, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers season one, like I can watch that and, you know, Rachel will be like, why the hell are you watching this? But like, it doesn't bother me at all. And I know some of the, the acting's terrible. The special <laughs> effects is atrocious. And, like, the writing is, like, so terrible, but, like, I'm glued to it. I love it. And I, I can see that with Turtles. It just doesn't – I mean, as much as Turtles has that effect on me, too, like, it is my childhood. I My mom loves telling me about, yeah. like, the Ninja Turtle parties I used to have as a kid and, like, all – I remember all the toys that she would have to get me. And, I mean, I, I remember that, and it's a big part of me, but just I can't go back to it. Nostalgia is a hell it of is. a drug. Was did you say? Sorry if you said this. Was Gargoyles? Did they just invent that as a yes. series? It wasn't. They nope. didn't base that on completely. Okay. Came from nothing. And they didn't like like most eighties cartoon. Well, it wasn't an eighties cartoon, but like a lot of cartoons, it wasn't really a vehicle for merchandising, right? Were there a lot of action figures? Did you have like Gargoyles? I did, but toys? they weren't great. I, I I didn't think that show was made just to be like a vehicle to no. sell. Yeah, like Action I remember figures. each gargoyle having its own toy, and I think like some of them had a different variation. Yeah. But overall, it didn't seem like that was the end goal of push toys out of gargoyles. Yeah. No, the whole their whole right. purpose with that one was specifically to take out Batman. And it um, <laughs> actually, you know, we were talking about um, you know the DC and Marvel argument. Do you know that's how Marvel started with Iron Man? 
they didn't have any of their AAA characters. So they had Thor, they had Iron Man, they had um, Incredible Hulk. I th- No, they didn't have Hulk, did they? I don't remember. But long story short, they, they didn't have any, like, they didn't have Spider-Man. He was the other big one. So, like, who are they going to market to make a new movie based on their, you know, their own soul studio. So what they did was they brought a bunch of kids in and they're like, all right, so out of all of these characters here, Thor, Iron Man, Captain America was the other one. That's it. So out of these three characters, which one of these would you want to play the most with as your brand new action figure? And they said Iron Man. And that is why they ended up picking Iron Man as the first movie to make. All to sell toys. It's kind of sad on how money runs everything. It, I guess so, but on the on at least they did yeah. a good job. <laughs> yeah, and that that was the, <laughs> on the that on was the, the gamble. Part. That was the gamble because the toys didn't even sell all that well. But like the movie was just fucking amazing. So from that, they were able right. to go on and create you know the modern MCU. But before that, Marvel didn't have this household name that it does now. Do you know who Thor was in like 2008? Probably not. Unless you actually let me take that back. Most people might know Thor, but did you know who Iron Man was if you didn't watch the cartoon as a kid? Who? Wow. Well, yeah. Nope. You don't count. Tim. I didn't. Yeah, I was gonna say. That. I was going to say, I grew up watching the cartoon. Yeah. I didn't know who Beta Ray Bill was before Marvel exactly. Lego games. Yep. So. I mean, that goes back to our Guardians of the Galaxy thing that, like, I grew up reading comics. I didn't even really know Guardians of the Galaxy when that movie came out. It's interesting to see what stuff they kind of cherry pick and turn into properties where they might not have had big followings prior. Because I didn't, I, well, then again, I didn't read a ton of Marvel, but, like, I knew Thor only from growing up with a love of like Norse mythology, but never as a comic book character. Yeah. Fortunate that the comic is fairly similar to what the real thing is. I mean, yeah. I know there's stark differences between the two, but I mean, it's ah, stark differences. Huh. And it's still, you know, <laughs> Thor, son of, son of Odin and Loki with his brother, sort of. Anyway, Although I'm surprised they never brought in Balder, I don't think. Which was the other brother, for at least from mythology, the other brother. Well, there's still another movie. I don't remember out, any so. character Balder. We shall see. We'll see. Love and Thunder. He didn't have a sister until uh, Ragnarok. Yeah. And then with, uh, oh God, what was the, there was a limited series. It was like a summer thing. I think it was like Original Sin. But um, then they announced that Thor had a long lost sister, Angela, from Asgard, who was like a Valkyrie. Um which was a character that they took from Spawn that Neil Gaiman had made, and then Marvel bought it, so they ended up just kind of slotting her into there and saying, like, oh, ta-da, you're related to Thor now. Get out there, kid. So so I think the important thing is, Nick, what was your favorite gargoyle? Goliath. All right, makes sense. Keith David. I can't do a Keith David. Nobody can. I'm pretty handy with technology. I'm assuming it's still the same. Smaller holes, more bites. Oh, what are we up to now, Mega? Terra. Terra. They did it, those bastards. They finally did it. No. I would have Keith David narrate my day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great choice. Just a brief sidebar on Keith David. If anybody follow or has the, the Shutter um, streaming service, check out a documentary called Horror Noir, which is all about um, uh, black representation in horror movies over the years. But uh, one of the like the talking heads that they have is Keith David sitting down with like um, Ken Foray and just chatting movies for a bit. And it's terrific. Well, you know, my first my very first movie was The Thing. Yes. I, I lived to the yes. very end. Yes. I survived. Yes. In my next movie, I, I did die, mm-hmm. but not till the end. There's our link me up. There's our monthly Keith David plug. <laughs> Okay. Put it on the Keith David block. So Tim, who was uh what is your r- number 3 on your list of reboots needed? Well, I feel weird following up um 90s Disney's Gargoyles with um 1971's Italian Giallo Aldo Lotto's Short Night of Glass Dolls. That's a very So So for those that um haven't heard of I've it. I've seen that. 
many times. What is that uh, about, Tim? And why do you feel needs a reboot? <laughs> so, glad you asked. Um, so, Short Night of Glass Dolls, it's a... Well, it... So... For anybody unfamiliar, it's listed as an Italian giallo, which giallo is just Italian for yellow. The whole thing is in the, I think, like late 60s, 70s, it kind of became known as its own genre for um, kind of thriller and mystery. Later on, it kind of became tied deeply with thrillers and mysteries and horror. Usually it's going to be like a, a mystery around like a black gloved figure that's killing people and all that kind of fun stuff. So it's part of the mystery was figuring out who's doing it at the end. So this one was labeled as such, but it was just an Italian thriller. So the whole thing is um, Jean Sorel. He plays a reporter who, at the beginning of the movie, they end up finding his body and it gets brought in for examination. Um, it looks to just be a corpse, but we find out through like his uh, voiceover and whatnot that he's still alive and aware. He just can't move. He can't kind of let anybody know they think he's dead. So he begins running through all his recent events in his mind that we end up seeing starting from kind of like a couple um, days ago, just so we can see how he got to where he was. And as time goes on, like he reveals that he had a girlfriend that went missing and he started investigating like what happened to her. And then he ended up getting like framed and suspected of murdering her. And the deeper he goes into investigating it, um, he ends up kind of finding out that there's this whole seedy occult underbelly to, I think it's like one specific club, but it's like the, the town um, and that there's like something sinister going on. But they keep jumping back and forth between his investigation of him thinking back to that. And then currently, as people are like examining the body and getting the body ready for stuff. Um, and it's kind of like a race against time of will he wake up? Like what's going to happen to him? Which, like, the... I love the movie. Um, it's more of a recent viewing that I've had this year, or rather in 2020. But, like, while I liked the original, I feel like giving this a modern remake while leaning more into that kind of surreal occult side of things would give it a little bit more of a horror territory kick. But also hopefully spark interest in people kind of returning to earlier films like this and then... Hopefully, from the nature of this, kind of discovering other great Italian film from the, the 60s and 70s. Because um, I know there's still, like, a following for a lot of, um, like, giallo films and Italian horror and whatnot. But I know this one kind of, um, even though most of them are known more for their gore, this one doesn't really have much in terms of gore. It's more so about the mystery aspect of it. Um, so I think it's kind of a nice way to get into the whole genre. So that's my TED Talk. Um, I... I'm familiar with Italian horror. Uh, Troll 2. That's an Italian horror movie, right? <laughs> it is. That was uh, Dario Argento's <laughs> Troll 2. <laughs> yeah. The follow-up to Lucio Falci's Troll 1. I can um, contribute. Resident Evil was based on the Italian zombie movie. Wasn't it? Zombie? Zombie 2. Or Zombie, yeah. Even though I think... Z um, I want to say Zombie... It was Fulci Zombie, but their big thing, um, I forgot what movie it was. They build it as a sequel to, I think, Dawn of the Dead. Yes. Even though it has no ties whatsoever to it. It's kind of like how they had the um, the movie Cruel Jaws in Italy <laughs> that stole most of, like, I think it was like John Williams' score from Star Wars and bits and pieces of Jaws. And it's supposed to be like Jaws 5, even though... It's not affiliated or has anything to do with any of the previous Jaws movies. So what made you pick that one? Because it seems kind of a really niche specific, like real underground choice. Mainly it's because like I've been trying to like broaden my horizons on a lot of films that I might have missed and kind of check out other stuff. And when I was watching it, it's it was interesting to me and it kind of hit all the or checked all the boxes that I was looking for. But it's also a case of it's a tough sell, especially nowadays, to just tell like a, a normal person off the street, hey, go check out this like 70s Italian mystery movie um, and let me know if you like it. You're probably not going to spend 90 minutes, sit down and watch it. It's um, so I feel like it's something getting a remake or 
that getting that reboot might end up making it more palatable for modern well, not audiences. if you market it like that i mean just like hey you like mystery you like horror you like like this watch this movie just leave out all of the bits that they may not like <laughs> well, I like I know it's it's a case of I've met many a person that as soon as you mention a movie is like, oh, it's in black and white. They shut it down immediately. Don't even mention that. Um, which this one, I mean, this one's in color, but still just in, in general. So, yeah, like I would have to. In Panavision. <laughs> <laughs> Vista vision. Um, New colorized. Um, so, yeah, I figured like this getting a modern remake to it might help um, make it more palatable for modern audiences, hopefully have people kind of give it a shot and then want to backtrack and go check out the earlier stuff. Plus, I mean, it's some of the stuff, anybody that likes um, Italian horror, the, so the writer is Ernesto Gastaldi, which he also did 1973's Torso, um, which I didn't love, but I guess that's also a cherished one. But uh, That's the, the only other kind of real um link in terms of other movies that i can think of other than that i think barbara box in it um who's also your famous. second pick <laughs> no um, it was an honorable mention um it was funny like i brought up the trailer at while you were describing the film and it almost like went perfectly with what i was watching and i just had it on <laughs> mute just kind of watching it um but i'm surprised that concept hasn't been taken and used because it seems unique enough. So if this movie gets um, remade in the next five years, we want to have any royalties to that idea because we know yes. where you got it from. I'm going to have to reach out to um, Aldo Lotto or uh, Ernesto Castaldi and see if I can buy the rights. Yeah, that's right. You become yeah. a producer. And definitely. we'll have, uh, who do we end up having as the, the bot Chris Evans. <laughs> Butts and seats. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like this could be like an Ari Aster or Robert Eggers kind of movie. Like, they, yes. I feel like they could put the right kind of spin on that. Especially the horror like, occult kind of like bringing that, like that. Yeah. Does it, is it, is it slowly introduced that side of it or is it? Yeah. So it starts working? mostly mystery and then it's like little stuff here and there. And then it kind of, it in the last like 10 minutes, it's like a fever pitch of just. Yeah, so th those guys would. That's. I mean, that's the kind of movies they've made so far. So, yeah, they could I probably mean, like, do a good job with that concept. They were the Ari Aster did uh, Hereditary. I didn't see Midsummer. I haven't Robert seen it Ag yet. Robert Eggers did the the Vivitch and um, <laughs> the Lighthouse. Yeah, so very moody, very not traditional. Which is odd that I loved Hereditary. I liked. Vivitch. I like The Witch, um, but then, like, for some reason, I never went and watched Midsummer or The Lighthouse. Um, they're both the Lighthouse on my list. is a trip. It's it's I it, it's kind it's kind of bonkers, but I really enjoyed. I like just watching really good performances, and I felt that uh, Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe were really interesting and fun to watch. Even though it's a, it's a very experimental-ish kind of psychological horror. So yeah, so that's Short Night of Glass Dolls. Um, also, fun fact, anybody, uh, the score was done by Ennio Morricone. Um, if anybody's familiar with his work as well. But yeah, like it's it's on Shutter also. So anybody that might want to check out the well, I was gonna say the original, it hasn't been remade yet. So check out the only one, um, and it, it's definitely worth the time. Let us know uh, what your thoughts are on it. But that's my number three. Because that brings us around to my number two. You can find it in the bathroom. So my number two. If you listen to our last rule of thirds, this will come as no surprise. Earthworm Jim. <laughs> Earthworm Jim, the movie. <laughs> they really screwed up when Jim Carrey started as Earthworm Jim in the 1997 live action film. Um, no. We want Willem Dafoe as Earthworm Jim. <laughs> oh, something yeah. I was, was going to say myself. something mean. I'm not going to. In case Willem Dafoe is ever on the show or listens to this, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, um, right now he's still Willem Dafriend. <laughs> God. 
Cut out all these puns. <laughs> oh, well, they're good. My Mortal audio Kombat. Would be gone. <laughs> Mortal Kombat. I won't belay this point any longer. Mortal Kombat. The first one or the second one? Uh, I'm sorry. There was a second Man, one. You thought it was that bad, huh? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, is, is somebody saying something about anything? Uh, yeah, 1995, uh, Mortal Kombat. It, you know, it was reached fever pitch in like 92, 93, 94 uh, in the pop culture sense. Uh, the games were a sensation to young kids like me and teenagers, maybe some adults. And they got the money and the licensing and the budget together for a feature film. Probably not a, I don't think it was a, Huge budget. Definitely didn't show in some parts of the movie. Um, it was a hit. Are you talking about the CGI reptile? <laughs> no, no, that was <laughs> that was perfectly fine. <laughs> um, I guess you know Jurassic Park and Terminator Two. They really set the bar high for visual effects. And if you didn't have that kind of money, which I don't think Mortal Kombat had, you know, trying to go the CGI route was going to really date it and they didn't lean into the effects all the time maybe i'd say like 80 percent of the movie is not really effect shots 80 90 yeah, i think of it's the movie. it's definitely a martial arts movie first and then like a cgi spectacle that's last. i mean martial arts movie first yes but i i'd say that's one of my reasons i think for i'd like to see another film made from it was because like i mean the actors when you're casting you got to get the person right for the role but the you know the physicality has to be there too. And Robin Shu was cast as as Liu Kang, the you know preliminary character. He obviously he did have a martial arts background, so that that helps. You can do a lot more in the fighting scenes uh, and the choreography when somebody is trained in, in martial arts for a kung fu movie like this is. But with Bridget Wilson and Lyndon Ashby playing Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade, it's there. You can tell there's lots of cuts during their fighting, and they try to do as as good as they can. But then, like I think in the modern day with movies like The Raid, Redemption, and its sequel, and there's probably other movies in that realm, uh, modern kung fu action movies that I haven't seen that are they've really raised the bar. I'd say for choreography and just just kick ass just like unrelenting like well choreographed well shot just feels real and brutal kind of fighting that i think mortal Kombat would benefit from not to mention the effects are much better today (laughs) than they were in 1995 there's a shot in the first movie where they go to outworld and it just like does this swirl up uh the castle where shang sung is holding sonya hostage it's completely digital except for sonya blade she's standing there like chained and handcuffed and it's it just looks so bad because they cut from that to like the real world and it looks nothing like the room they were just standing in it looks like it was ms dos like wolfenstein or or something <laughs> like it was that bad but i mean you can forgive you could I, forgive an old movie its limitations with special effects as long as the rest of it is better and i did love this movie as a kid oh yeah um but i I I definitely want to do this as an episode at some point yeah i i watched it i actually watched it recently because i just i i got side note i got the special edition or in a new pressing vinyl of the soundtrack not the song soundtrack but the score the was it like a mondo release or just clinton score yes I, no, actually, no. I don't think Mondo did. George it. S. Cl- George Clinton, the Parliament Funkadelic. Or? Is it George S. Clinton? Isn't the isn't the Parliament Funkadelic? That's oh, why I said S. I don't know. I just oh. yeah. It's a different George Clinton. It's. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear that Mortal Kombat soundtrack. <laughs> More Mortal funk. Kombat with just a funky bass. Funk foo. Where, uh, yeah, so I, I, I kind of got in the kick and I realized I don't have, I don't own this movie anymore. It was actually the first DVD I bought, but I don't have it anymore. So I got the Blu-ray and watched it. And it's, it holds up to a degree, but it's, Mortal Kombat is a campy, not campy, but it's like kind of cheesy and over the top, like the property itself. So I think they tried to play that up in the movie and it just, I, it doesn't work as much for me anymore. Although I love certain parts to the movie, I feel like it could be done 
again, I'd like to see the world is so expansive. I'd like to see this one again as like an HBO or a Netflix kind of like series because there's over the years they've built up a, a massive kind of world and lore and stories and characters could go you could very very deep into the well of things they've created and they have over the years like there was a live action show called Mortal Kombat Conquest I think it was like a USA or a TNT yeah, I was show, say, I think it was TBS. TNT um that covered the great Kung Lao years like the the first person to win Mortal Kombat on Earth and stop the takeover, which is the point of Mortal Kombat, is to you have to defend yourself from an invading force, which was Shao Kahn at the time. That covered that. There was Defenders of the Realm, which I barely remember. It was a cartoon series. Much has changed since the last Mortal Kombat tournament. Dark forces of Outworld have begun invading the Earth realm. These attacks are seriously weakening Earth's dimensional fabric, enabling not only Outworlders to enter the Earth realm, but warriors from other domains as well. Only the most extraordinary warriors could possibly meet this challenge. Liu Kang, Princess Kitana, Sub-Zero, Jax. Sonya Blade. Nightwolf. Kiva. Curtis Stryker. Driven by purpose and bound by honor, these are the defenders of the realm. In the middle, mid-90s. And it recently, uh, there was the web series too that was kind of okay like it still falls into that it's very low budget so it's and a little bit campy and it just i guess it's like growing up the things you love you want it to grow up with you or just to be like please put more thought and consideration to this like i know it has a catchy gimmick like it's fighting and it's fantasy and there's blood and guts and like but i think there's a, they they create a lot more of an interesting world beyond that. And I think people, us, us fans, like just see these characters and we want them to give the same thought and talent, like as you give the Mandalorian and like get a good, you can get a good show out, out of fantasy and out of sci-fi, like with, with enough thought put into it. And they are going to be, there is a new movie coming out. They shot it last year before the pandemic. They did some reshoots, I think, during the pandemic. Uh, and it's set to come out in April. But oh, I haven't heard anything about that. Yeah, yeah. It's a completely new live-action movie. Um, so I guess I'm getting my wish, in a sense. But I'll be holding my breath, I guess. Because it's, you know, again, it's a cast of unknowns, which is okay. Like, we don't need Brad Pitt to play Johnny Cage. I don't really want Brad but, uh, Pitt in... <laughs> sometimes you just get yeah. like triple A'd out like sometimes just you really do need like no name people to step that's in that's okay because it's distracting so you can see the character rather than the actor yeah like when they did Fantastic Beasts and then at the big reveal at the end you realize that Grindelwald is actually not um, Colin Farrell but it's, it's Johnny Depp instead like that was so distracting and then that whole movie based on him I don't see his character in the sequel I just see Johnny Depp and then seeing another triple A guy come in, like when John um, Donnie Yen was in Rogue One, I only saw Donnie Yen. Yeah, he's a great martial artist, but you know, just his name is too big for the movie that he's in. And I think that like, s- same thing would go with like a new Mortal Kombat thing. Like if they were to put in like Wesley Snipes, which at this point I'm sure he'll take any movie, but. <clears throat> If he steps in and to, decides to do like martial arts for like as one of the villains or just one of the characters, the fact that you can see his face in it, I feel it takes you out of the movie too much. And having that no name actor step in, you get to truly enjoy the role for what it is. And then they can actually have enough fun with it instead of it's just not another Brad Pitt movie or another Johnny Depp movie. I would agree, if you, agree with you on the most part. I do think some actors can just can melt in there and you can, if they're that good, you just kind of accept it. I mean, established properties are harder because you have this idea of the character in your head. Gary Oldman. Um, 
he melds into anything <laughs> he can, he can that be he's anybody. In. Doesn't matter. It's never a Gary Oldman movie. It's just he happens to be in it. I want to see Gary Oldman as Luke Kang in this movie. <laughs> they should recast him. In fact, actually, Dean couldn't come up tonight, so this has actually been Gary Oldman this entire time. <laughs> Hello. Wait, that's, is that how he sounds? I'm Gary Oldman. Um, I'm uh, primarily an actor. Yeah, he's British. <laughs> is he British? I'm still a mystery to you. I forget what movie this guy has been in. Uh, the Last Samurai. Tom Cruise. Yuki Sonata. He's playing Scorpion. Um, what else is I think he was in The Wolverine, maybe? You'd know his face if you saw him. Here, Yuki Sonata's playing Scorpion. So is this like the actual, the Mortal Kombat, um, this like is when the Liu King movie. gets involved? Or is this going to be prior with all the drama between Scorpion and Sub-Zero? So the speculation is... So this, so this is as a, this is all the main original characters plus Mortal Kombat two characters, which does have me plus worried smoke because if you unlock him. Yeah, <laughs> he's in after credits. It's a after they have credits. a separate side theater that has the scenes with smoke. You have to pay the the extra ticket unlock. I I think they're doing the first movie again, or the first story. I think, but the there's a catch where they're introducing. I think, I think they're bringing in. An audience character where in the first movie Liu Kang was the audience surrogate he was kind of like he didn't believe in Mortal Kombat or the the stories about it so you kind of like he was us like learning about all this stuff all the human characters regular human earth characters were like that now there's the there's a character oh I forget his name there it's a completely just new character that's in the uh, cast list and they think like they're just bringing in some random person to freddy krueger to be <laughs> sure. yeah jason Voorhees, uh the predator lewis tan <laughs> lewis lewis T- well that's the that's the actor i think he's i think he's playing this yeah, made up. and the wiki shows that as undisclosed yeah that they think he's going to be some new surrogate character which doesn't have me pumped but preserve judgment until like literally nothing about this movie has been talked about oh my one other point was uh joe taslim i don't know how you say his name joe taslim he was in the rage redemption he's playing Bihan sub-zero so to my point about being able to showcase awesome brutal fighting maybe they will be able to if they're casting him and maybe maybe these other people i don't know the other the martial martial arts backgrounds but Scorpion's actor is 60 years old, so I don't know how much fighting he's going to be doing, which does have me worried. Maybe they'll use a double, or he's just that, in that good a shape that he can still fight at 60. But I guess I we'll think see. the movie should have been all the stuff that went on between Scorpion and Sub Zero. This way they can film through the pandemic since they all wear masks. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't have to stop clan. a day. Yeah. Do you know if it's an R? I think they are going R. So I think they are bringing the blood. Bloody element. Just want to see it fatality. It's going to premiere on HBO Max April 16th. Yeah, it's a Warner movie, Ooh. so it's an April, and it's an April release. So it's not too far off, but it's just weird that we haven't seen anything from it. I think I think the producer said a trailer is dropping this month sometime. So I guess we'll see. We'll see what kind of money they put. Like a very good this. choice team. I, I think it. I think it. I would rather have it as a series because, again, I think, like you said, is it the more is it the Scorpion Sub Zero story, like that? They could do seasons on like, like I would love a season a just the whole Kung Lao thing, right? Yeah, exactly. You could start there and then season two, you could kill him off at the end of the season, like a uh, a Ned Stark, like oh shit, I thought he was the main character, like nope. They are shooting for going. an R rating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think there'll be fatalities. fatalities. They could just just leave the cheeky stuff out. You don't have to say toasty. You don't have to say fatality or flawless victory. Just, you know. You would want know that that's, stuff that's is there just, from the game. Yeah, that's just fan service. I'm sure they'll throw in one thing, though. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. toasty. It's going to be like Scorpion sets a guy on fire and somebody's like, that guy looks toasty. Yeah. <laughs> and then he should have gotten the camera. over here. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, Mortal Kombat. So it's, I mean, I, I knew going into this, they were making, a, they are rebooting it, but I, uh, my hopes are that it will meet expectations. I, I have low expectations, but we'll see. With an IP like Mortal Kombat, it's really tough because 
it's a fine line it has to follow because it does want to follow the game but it has to kind of do its own thing because if it goes too far in one direction you get like street fighter the movie and not the animated one you don't want that <laughs> Well, that the movie was them going off on their well, own it, direction. Yeah, it was it, kind of as it's to the point where they had to make a game called Street Fighter the movie the game because it didn't follow <laughs> the game. <laughs> I remember yeah. that one too. But I think Mortal Kombat's a great choice, Dean. And now I'm going to be on the lookout for the movie. So that brings us to mix number two. Warcraft. <laughs> it has begun. War is coming. So why are you here? To save our people. We must fight together. Can we trust him? They're beasts. They should all be destroyed. Are you sure about that? We'll protect the kingdom. You and I. We will try, my friend. Warcraft, rated PG-13. Fair. <laughs> Tim, what's yours? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so Warcraft. I, I did not touch. I didn't touch that movie. Yeah, you'll have to fill me in. Um, Set America. <laughs> I really wished this movie did better than it did. And then when it came down to it, I knew the only reason this would get a sequel is if it made money. So I'm watching the box office, and it didn't do that well in America, but in China it did very well. But no one cares. An American film isn't going to make a sequel, even if China really likes it. The U.S. would need it first. So I knew once I saw the numbers, like, they'll talk about a sequel for the next, like, year or two, but they're they're never going to get one off the ground. And it's exactly what happened. Because this is one of the cases of, like, an alternate reality where... <clears throat> You know Star Wars in its entirety, knowing how awesome 4, 5, and 6 are. But in this alternate reality, Episode 1 came out and it bombed. And that's it. So you know, like, shit, there's so many better stories after Episode 1 that can be told. Specifically, like, you know, just the original, like, or, you know, Episode 4. And that, <clears throat> knowing... They had to do the storyline from Warcraft so early that I have a really good feeling that was the whole reason for it not doing so well. Because, yeah, it's orcs and humans, but out of the entire Warcraft lore, there's a ton of it. But their biggest story is revolving around their, you know, the Lich King and having not been able to get to that point, nor will they ever, is really disheartening because... I, that is the movie that I wanted to see. Well, I think it was like a damned if you do, damned if you don't of they need to put in enough stuff to make it recognizable as a Warcraft property. Mm -hmm. And like, so fans are like, oh, OK, like, yeah, I can see what they're doing, but then also make it palatable enough for normal audiences who aren't familiar so they don't get confused. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it ends up being a mid like middle of the road where it it's not a movie for either side. Yep. And this was during like the height of Game of Thrones popularity, too. So people were going to eat it up like, oh, this is more like medieval type stuff. But instead of it just being with like humans and stuff, there's orcs, too. Like they had so much potential and it just kills me on how they had to pick that one storyline. I just feel like if they were to just pick something a little more modern, a lot more people would have been able to relate to it. Because, like, I know you grew up with the original Warcraft, and you played it, Tim, so you're familiar with yeah. that storyline, but, like, a vast majority of the fan base never played that one. The orcs have been driven from the Northlands as the hulking remains of Blackrock Spire lay silent amongst the freed lands of Azeroth. The battered remains of the once mighty horde have rallied to protect their last bastion of hope, the Great Portal. With Lord Lothar dead, you have been given the duty of leading the forces of Lordaeron to ultimate victory over the horde. A victory that lies with the destruction of the Great Portal itself. Most people played Warcraft 3, which is the storyline that I'm talking about. Because that shows the rise and fall of, like, that one guy named Arthas. He's supposed to be this new badass. 
and then something bad happens to his people and then he decides i'm gonna do whatever it takes in order to save my people and oh there's this cursed sword well i can i can use this sword to help protect my people and it ends up you know consuming him he turns into the big bad and then he ended up becoming the big enemy that when he tried to be the guy to save everyone he was actually the one that ended up kind of killing everyone instead you lied to your men and betrayed the mercenaries who fought for you What's happening to you, Arthas? Is vengeance all that's important to you? Spare me, Muradin. You weren't there to see what Malganus did to my homeland. There's still one chance. Help me claim Frostborn. If it's as powerful as you said, it might tilt the scales in our favor. I have a bad feeling about this, lad. I would gladly bear any curse to save my homeland. Leave it be, Arthas. Forget this business and lead your men home. Damn the men! Nothing shall prevent me from having my revenge, old friend. Not even you. Now, I call out to the spirits of this place. I will give anything or pay any price. If only you will help me save my people. And it just the way that his whole storyline is set up is very reminiscent to like that fallen hero archetype, you know, a tragic villain. <clears throat> it's very Vader. Very, very Vader. That story is so much has a lot more potential and it happens at much more of a pivotal storyline like or like it happens during more of a pivotal story arc than, you know, in the very beginning where they establish the dark portal and then they go through and then it's the humans first discovering who these orcs are and just, uh... I feel like it, the Warcraft property is definitely something that would have made use of a, a, like, a series format as opposed to here's an hour and a half movie to condense all of this down into. Yeah, yeah. They, they took, like, even for, like, if it would have been made from a book... That still should have been at least like two movies, and they had to condense so much down just so that it would fit into like the two hour time, the two hour time slot that they had set up. So yeah. these the, the movie based on the real time strategy games or the the MMO RPG? Both. Both. So the okay. I mean, I know they're the same. Those are related, but I didn't know if this story comes from yeah. Both of them, kind of? Okay. World of Warcraft is, you know, the MMO, but that is all of the lore, and they try to be a lot more concise and specific with it, whereas um, it's still the... it's The MMO still references the same events that happened in the real-time strategies, but it puts it in a more linear, concise, like, timeline and structure, Whereas with the um, RTS, like you're looking at an RTS map, so like you know certain things don't line up correctly geographically, or just the way that the whole interaction, like you played Metal Gear Solid, that whole like thing the whole time when he's like you know oh Gray Fox he was in you know, Zanzibar. Do you remember me now? Can't be. You were killed in Zanzibar. And then when you play the real game. It's like, hi, I'm Gray Fox. The prisoners are in the next room. And then that's the whole conversation. <laughs> that's kind of what like the MMO does versus the, um, the, the RTS. And like it just elaborates a lot more on those same plot points. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, because that Warcraft is something I have zero experience with. I didn't catch the movie and I, didn't, I haven't played oh, any so iteration of the game. You're part of the problem. Dean, it could have been your $15 that could have got me my sequel. I mean, now's the time to join in, Dean. Download uh, Shadowlands tonight. Find us on Whisperwind. <laughs> how, often, how often does a poorly made first movie turn into a better sequel? That though, sounds like another that. top three. <laughs> you could argue... Throw that topic down. The Terminator, but I mean, the, the first Terminator is, I don't know. I mean, it's... I mean, kind of I would say movies. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 is better than Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Don't at me. <laughs> troll 2, probably better than Troll True. 1. <laughs> I have a but lot they of have thoughts nothing, on Troll no, 1. They have nothing to do with each other. So yeah, I mean, um, like, if they were to do a series um, where we get, like, the... Okay, if they want to do the whole thing starting from the beginning with the, the humans and the orcs meeting, and then slowly build it out through the games, like, okay, so Warcraft 2, uh, I think it's... Was it Warcraft 2, 
Beyond the Dark Portal, Warcraft 2, Dark Tides or something like that, um, Warcraft 3, and then go into Cruise World Control. of Warcraft, they can do a season for each expansion at that point and just do like vanilla BC onwards and outwards at that point. And then we're 17 seasons in and it's... <laughs> You know, we've been playing WoW for like 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> On and off. I will never play WoW. <laughs> that's that's not true. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'll never say never, but I see you guys talking on our Discord like, I don't know what the hell's going on. You can always join it's in, just an, It's an RPG. I mean, it's just, I, I enjoy the RPGs we have played together, so I'm sure I would enjoy it. It's just... There's, there's a lot of things pulling my attention and all of our attention these days. Well, plus that's a lifestyle game. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things where like you need to put in time on it. It's not just like I'll play for ten minutes once a week. Right. So, yeah, I agree, Nick. Warcraft would definitely make use of it. Just imagine Henry Cavill as Arthas. That would be fun. Yeah. You'd probably I convince him. Wouldn't have to. <laughs> the man already plays. That's one of the yeah. big jokes. And that he said that when he got hired as Superman, when he got like the casting call, like, hey, you're you're Superman, he ignored the phone call because he was in the middle of his wow raid. <laughs> That's, I read that story. Or you do you told me, yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious. Instantly relatable. Yep. That's hilarious. So Henry Cavill, you got my vote. So that brings us to my number two, which I feel a little called out from Nick mentioning this during Mortal Kombat, <laughs> Street Fighter. <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme. When the stakes are high. If my $20 billion are not delivered, the hostages will die. He's the best there is. Now, who wants to go home? And who wants to go with me? Jean-Claude Van Damme, Raul Julia, Street Fighter. I'm the repo man. And you're out of business. Rated PG-13. I like both equally for each of their own merits because it's literally two sides to the same coin. Mortal Kombat tried to be a lot more serious with its whole thing and it tried to stay close to like somewhat of the source material but still trying to be like serious and you know self-aware. Street Fighter was just like fuck it let's get as many people as hey you know what can you fight but you know you look exactly like E Honda let's just come on in you can do it. <laughs> E Honda was Hawaiian in that movie, right? Or was he Japanese? I'm sumo, brother. My body could be in one place, my mind another. Next time your mind leaves, tell to bring back pizza. He had a Hawaiian shirt on. <laughs> Maybe that's why I thought he was Hawaiian. You know, actually, like, somewhat digressing, but I had no idea. In Batman Returns, do you know Max Shrek's son is Zangief in this movie? I had no idea. Did you know that the guy who played Zangief... Uh, later went on to play Leatherface in the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie since like 2008. Yeah, but he he has a mask on. You don't you don't know it's him. I would not have it's just weird to think a, of a career. <laughs> it's just weird to think of like him as Leatherface now, and then think of the scene when the uh, was it like the car is on the TV or something. He's like, "Quick, change the channel." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Wait, that guy's sawing people in half now." When they like, he, he gives the like sideways thumbs up and they like correct him, like they turn it right side up. Yeah. I still love the, <laughs> the scene oath. with him with him and DJ, and he's like, So you still fight for Bison after finding out what he's been doing? And he's like, Yeah, because he's paying me a fortune. You're getting paid? <laughs> 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 Can we start using that as the meme instead of the one from Where the Millers? Oh, Wait, right. you guys are getting paid? Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. keep all the rest of the meme except change out that last portion to just be Zangi from Street Fighter. I think it's fitting because isn't that kid always getting like the short end of the stick through the whole movie? Yeah. <laughs> Wait. So, so Tim, why why would you? What's wrong with oh, Street just Fighter the movie? <laughs> so okay. So I should probably mention. So Street Fighter. Any of you guys? Well, not you guys. I know you're intimately familiar with Street Fighter. So anybody that doesn't know the story, the whole movie is Despot and Bison captures relief workers during his Civil War takeover of the nation of Shadowloo. Um, and pretty much ransoms them back to the UN. So Jean-Claude Van Damme as Colonel Guile decides to kind of get a crew together of street fighters um, to <laughs> kind of go back and take them by force. Various street fighter com stars come and go. Um, and then eventually kind of all their plot lines intermingle at the end. 
Um, my big thing is like, I still have a soft spot for Street Fighter. And I, I remember back when my cousins that I mentioned that had the video store, like my parents had to go to a wedding one time. So we ended up going to stay there. So like I ordered a bunch of like food from the, the pizza place next door. It was my first time having mozzarella sticks. So I ate like a ton of them. We went downstairs in the basement. We flipped on Street Fighter. It had just hit like VHS. It was going to be great. And then whatever I had eaten, I got sick. So I remember for like the hour and a half of Street Fighter, I just had a bucket and I was just getting sick the entire time. That's why you won't eat <laughs> mozzarella sticks a reaction sticks to anymore. the movie. <laughs> so that's also why I don't like mozzarella sticks. Um, you weren't but, sick, yeah, Tim. So you were just, you were, it was what you were watching. <laughs> it's the food so, aversion. I get that. I don't like hard boiled eggs. So like my big thing is... I still enjoy the movie, like going back and brushing up on it for this. Like I was going through and watching some of the, the quotes and things like that. And it's still they make me laugh or like the ones with Raul Julia. I still love him as M. Bison. Yeah, that's very inner. Probably the best part of the movie. Just because like I love him. Yeah. And he's the guy's charismatic. But the I feel like it's not necessarily a case of it needs a remake or reboot because I didn't like this one. It's just it didn't follow the source material and i feel like it has a good story like the they don't need a remake of this plot but if they do a reboot that's more accurate live action for like something to street fighter 2 the movie like the um the animated one or um i know they did street fighter legacy and assassin's fist um that were the fan made ones that got the blessing from capcom that they did later i think nick showed me those Oh, um, is that the live action with Ken and Ryu? Yeah, yeah, and then they did like the longer movie version of it. Like, I need to if rewatch they, that. If they take the stories that they had from these and then did something like that, where they kind of kept the, they're doing it from a fan standpoint of, we're making this not because it's like, oh, we can cash in on the property. We're making it because we grew up on the games. We love the games and we want to be able to tell a story with the characters. Um, so I think like, that's why this would benefit from a, a remake or a reboot, um, which if that's the case, because I know they released the other ones that I just mentioned, but I feel like they need to have a, a wide release one that I would love to have like hit theaters or hit streaming or something with a little more fanfare to kind of get the ball rolling on this again. Because um, otherwise, like people aren't necessarily going to go out and search out the other ones on their own unless they're aware they're out there, which they should because they're great. Like, even if you just take the three minutes to watch Street Fighter Legacy, like, it's it's fun. I don't like to gatekeep, and I really, especially in the last, I'd say, couple of years, I really want to welcome as many new people into the fandom as possible because, you know, the more love something gets, the more likely cooler shit will happen. But um, when it comes to making movies, especially ones like Street Fighter, just because you all say you're fans of the movie or, you know, fans of the media, can you please at least make sure you know how to do, like... A Hadouken in the game before you say that you're a fan of the show or movie <laughs> because I feel like you keep Tiger. watching these docu yeah you keep watching these documentaries and like yeah we're huge fans of the source material and then you see that like the results of what they made and it's like have you guys even seen the source material like the Chun-Li movie like why oh, was I there about this. yeah why was there so much creative um license taken on that movie <laughs> And they marketed it like it's a Street Fighter movie when they know, like, you know, street, fans of Street Fighter are not going to see this. They're going like, to hate it. It's like the Resident Evil 5 or 6 of, of Street Fighter, right? Yeah. Like, w they're going to come in wanting to see all this cool stuff, and they, they didn't deliver. I don't get it. And that's all I ask is, like, you know, I don't mean to gatekeep, but, like, just prove to me that you've you've played it at least once and, like, do a Hadouken for me. Oh, sure, you can anything. Oh, you're not a shuttle character? That's fine. Just do anything with a special, like, a special move. You do a charge? What do you do? <laughs> like, I, I mean, Flash I kick. would I would be fine with whatever they do as long as they come out and they're honest about it. Like, if yeah. a director came out and was like, hey, this is the project I've been put on. I'm going to try to do, like, something that's going to be fun for you guys. I'm not familiar with it. I'm going to try to do my best. I'm like, okay, cool, man. Just do your thing. I'm on board with it. Don't come out and be like, I chose this project because I grew up on this and yada, yada. And it's like, don't don't tell me what I want to hear. <laughs> yeah, I feel they like, do that too often. And it's just like, come on, man, for something as big of an IP as that, I'm pretty sure if they were to publicly say, yo, we're making a Street Fighter movie, we need a director who's willing to step in. And like, it's not like there's going to be met with silence. 
you yeah. know there's going to be fans out there that like I legitimately have played and loved this game and it would be a dream project of mine to work on this type of movie. Yeah, which the the writer and director for this one, Steven D'Souza, um, had done, I think this was his only directing gig um, because normally he's a writer, which I know he's wrote a lot of stuff or at least helped write a lot of stuff that we do like, like he did The Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He helped co-write uh, Commando, 48 Hours, Die Hard 1 and 2, uh, Hudson Hawk um, and the the Sly Stallone Judge Dredd which something that doesn't need a remake or reboot because they already did Judge they Dredd did well the Carl awesome. Urban version they is did great. so good yeah. um, like I, another episode things that deserve a sequel give me Carl Urban again as Dredd um, or just give more me frown. more frowning please more frowning Give me 10 more Carl Urban vehicles. <laughs> Cast him as the new Bruce Wayne. Doom, Doom 2. Doom 2. Bring back The Rock. <laughs> um, so yeah, like it's, I feel like he, as a writer, um, I've liked his stuff. So I think ultimately it was just a case of it, it probably wasn't a passion project or I don't know if it was like just too many hands in the pot or they were more intent on trying to get something out studio wise because of the, the love of Street Fighter, the games that were going on. Um, but like, it's clearly not any sort of deficiency by the, the cast and crew. Like they, I think overall it was fun. Um, I think it was just something that was a little misguided. I love the, like the cast. I think it was the first time I've saw, I saw, uh, was it Ming-Na Wen? She played Chun-Li in this. She was also, I think the, the voice of Mulan in the original Mulan. Um, and now, she, and now on the Mandalorian. Yes. Um, so quickly, she's I crossed, just want to say, oh, she's not only a Disney princess, but she's in Marvel and she's in Star Wars. Oh, yeah, because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. She has mm-hmm. been the trifecta. <laughs> no one could touch that. It was Zoe, Zoe Saldana. She got Star Trek. Uh, Marvel. Well, there's a third one, I thought. But she's well, she played prop- in The Losers, which was another comic property movie. I thought there was just another big thing that. She was like, you know, one of those high grocers, like Avatar. She happens to be in like huge. Oh, the Avatar. Yes, that's the other one. That's exactly. Yeah. It. If the sequels ever come out. Right. Um, <laughs> I just want to say my favorite three moments that stick with me, just like really flash moments from Street Fighter are when Guile does the flash, the backflip flash kick on Bison because it just looked awesome. And the second one is also a kick. When Chun Li kicks M Bison, she like drops she she snaps her her handcuffs and like drop kicks him over the couch. That was really cool. So when movie. anybody kicks M Bison, <laughs> yes, that's, that's the best part of the movie. And the and the number one moment is back to uh, John Claude and fighting Raul Julia. He flexes his bicep with the American flag <laughs> tattoo, and it's just like. <laughs> It's on. It's on par with the Arnold and uh, Carl Weathers handshake in Predator. It's just like, oh man, that's that's dripping with American, old American masculinity. I mean, I, which now is toxic. No, probably Nick. <laughs> it, his favorite part is probably the whole Raul Julia when Bison visited your village. It's the most impactful day of your life. To me, it was a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, that's a great line. That's a great line. You don't remember? For you. The day Bison graced your village was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. Way to steal my thunder, Tim. (laughs) You can do it now and I'll just edit it in. No, it's too late. The viewers already know. I'll gladly pay you I mean, Tuesday for a hamburger. The best quote of the movie is still Sean Claude Van Damme when he does the news report thing and he's like, We're going to go up Reaver and I'm going to kick that son of a bitch bison's ass so hard, the next bison <laughs> wannabe will feel it. And then he does like the arm thing in front of a camera. <laughs> it's like, okay, so So are we forming a group or is this like a posse? <laughs> I'm not going home. I'm gonna get on my boat. And I'm going up river, and I'm going to kick that son of a bitch bison's ass so hard that the next bison wannabe is gonna feel it. 
as good as Raul Julia was, like, do they look at the character Aunt Bison and be like, huge, physical, imposing specimen, like, Raul Julia is the man. I guess for the movie they created, he fit the bill, but it's just, he needs that, he, what well, he has those, what powers? They're like in his gloves. Like he has not superpowers, but like a, it's, oh, it's technology. Oh, in the movie? Yeah, in the movie. I yeah. I don't remember. This is merely superconductor electromagnetism. Surely you've heard of it. He just he needed those to be, have a chance to fight yeah. anybody. I, I think they I just really leaned remember. into like the dictator bison type thing as opposed to like the competent fighter and bison. Right. Street fighter. Yeah. <laughs> the comp- <laughs> competent dictator. That's well, the that was the other secret. title. And they're like, eh, we're not going to be able to market competent dictator, the movie, the game. So, Parents, you're complaining about Mortal Kombat, brainwashing your kids, but not competent dictator? The food court should be larger. All the big franchises will want in. Uh, so, that's number two. Oh, also, the... This will come up again later, but the score from Street Fighter was Graham Revel, um, who did a, a ton of other things like The Crow, Power Rangers, the movie from Dust Till Dawn, The Craft, Sin City, Titan AE, and the the last movie on my list. So interesting to see, like, it's things like that where I've never heard of somebody before and then all of a sudden see that they had a hand in, like, all properties that I loved as a kid. So thanks, Graham. So now the number one film of all time that deserves a remake or a reboot, Dean Fisher, go. Forever. Forever. Yes. No, it's a Sandlot. That's my re... No. Um, actually, should I have chosen that? No, you can't. That's a classic. No. Edit this out. You're killing me, Smalls. For those that know me well, this will come as a shock. But Jurassic my Park. Choice, I think I think Nick would disown me if I said Jurassic Park. But I guess you could say it needs rebooted with and if it were to, yeah, stuff. if it would have been rebooted, I would have preferred a book version. Right. An R rated Jurassic Park. Yeah. And one that really <laughs> followed like language. the book like not per <laughs> like page for page, but at least followed the All book. With a rocket launcher. Yeah. There's a <laughs> rocket launcher involved. There's um Hammond, Hammond gets eaten by zombies. Yeah. He, he, uh, he doesn't die. Ha- he doesn't have a peaceful death in bed. Like he dies, he's he's eaten. He's also not likable either. <laughs> right. I just want to see the T-Rex and then Muldoon comes in on the helicopter and he's like, smile, you son of a bitch, and blows him up. <laughs> but no, it's not Jurassic Park. It is the teach... As I... As video evidence, video evidence from 1989 and 19... 19- 90 home movie evidence would would let you know i used to say teach mooch ninch turtles teenage mutant ninja turtles they're young yeah they're cool excellent they're amphibious i never asked to look for a cat opener america's most radical superheroes are now a real live movie a fellow checker eh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Rated PG. Lean, green, and on the screen, March 30. Has been my number one love my entire life since I had memories. Or met your wife. Or personality. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That's been my number one, my near and dear property, as it has been for... I know you guys love it. I don't think it's your number ones. I could, but it's my number one. I mean, I think it would um, definitely make top ten. Right? Yeah, and that's I. It would make a lot of people's top tens. I'm just one of the number one people. I may not like the show much, but the movies were a lot better than the Power Rangers ones. That's for damn sure. Well, you know, number one, and and and. Dude, I liked all of extent. them, to be honest, except for three. Yeah. I liked the animated one that they did, TMNT, and I really didn't mind the Michael Bay ones. But Yeah, I guess that's my endorsement, too. Didn't mind. Yeah. Um, stuff, again, for a property that continuously just lives on as a children's property, it's like, 
I don't think we're ever going to get what we want, but I can still be hopeful. And that's what I, I think the first movie was probably the closest we'll ever get to yeah. something I would want to see. If again. they were to make. But that's, that's what my hope would be is for not, not don't ignore the first movie. Don't necessarily maybe ignore. In terms of third continuity <laughs> and like universe, you would want a sequel from the first movie specifically. Exactly. And that actually, um, I guess just Henson puppets, I think, can still work in a modern age. And I would reference um, the, I don't know if you guys saw Where the Wild Things Are. No. Yeah. Did you guys see that Spike Jones movie? Mm -hmm. And that was a combination of CGI and uh, practical. Those, like, those were actually huge monsters, you know, puppet suits that they had, but they just... Uh, with CGI added, you know, facial expressions and didn't rely on animatronics to do the, the talking. And I think it, I think it as effects wise, it holds up. And anyway, it's can you make a case for bringing Henson back. Now, Brian Henson leads his father, Jim Henson's company. And with all the advancements, the advancement in robotics and just the technology in 30 years, like I think you could, even if you weren't using CGI for like the faces or eyes or whatever, you could make really convincing turtles even in today's age. And I think there's just a, there's a charm that's lost when they become seven foot CGI behemoths, um, yeah. like in the Michael Bay versions. Like, and I still think there's a, there's a, there's a kid's movie bite that the first movie had that just the grittiness, cause they, that was a low budget movie and it became a runaway hit. I think for years um, it was the highest grossing independent film. Right, yeah, until uh, what, 1999. What was that? Uh, Blair Witch. The Blair Witch, right. That, like, that, yeah, for 10 years, it was the highest grossing independent film. But I just think they could take that aesthetic. And actually, it came up recently that Bobby Harbeck, who was a co writer on the first movie, it, it's kind of vague, but I don't know why they were talking to him. Somebody was talking to him specifically, but he said he was in talks or talking trying to get a Halloween-esque, ignore the sequels, direct sequel to the John Carpenter first movie uh, that came out that uh, Danny McBride and I forget who was... Uh, um, David Allen Green? Yeah. They or David made Austin Halloween. Green? Yeah. They made the, Hallow the Halloween sequel. Brian Austin Green? Brian Austin Green. Um, <laughs> no, that's not him. Wait. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the 90210 guy. Yeah, same guy. <laughs> <laughs> they you know they ignored all the sequels and just like here's a direct you know 30 year later story to the first uh, movie and could they do that with this i don't know because they probably have to invent a lot of stuff with they wouldn't be teenage anymore they'd be would they be middle-aged mutant ninja turtles also david gordon but i green. think david gordon green that's right um you could potentially do a, a 90s era movie. I mean, that's not unheard of. To do I feel like nostalgia's piece. at a high these days that you can do like a, do it practical in like suits and animatronics and whatnot. Do it a follow-up. I mean, I would even do it a follow-up to the one and TMNT 2, Secret of the Ooze. Yeah, I could take either or. Like you could ignore two. or It's like both like of those were okay, deeply so. ingrained in childhood. I know like the second one went a little lighter in terms of like the, a more... The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon, the cartoon route. Right. Yeah. yeah, which was probably because like parents have kids that love this first one. They're like, "Ew, little dark. Lighten it up a little bit." Oops. But I think I like just... both of them pair perfectly together i'm just angry that between movies like i don't know why people decide like they have to make it their own but they change designs like just because it's a new movie i want to do it my way well, it's like every they, movie where jason's mask changed in friday every, the 13th yeah. well yeah maybe it's I like don't you know mean to tell me he goes out and he finds a new mask every year <laughs> <laughs> that's the one thing michael myers got right it was always just a uh william shatner mask with wild hair um, Except in four and five, where we see him, I think, like escape from somewhere, and then he walks into a store and just grabs another mask. It's like you mean to tell me that a a white William Shatner mask just happens to be sold in <laughs> most stores? <laughs> These things are hot. <laughs> we need to order more. 
This is but, what they like, wore when the they killed all those movie, kids last so, year. The first movie, the turtles are so distinctly in their design, unique. And by the third movie, you could take the mask off and not know which turtle you were looking yeah. at. Which, where in the first movie, you could you would know which turtle it was if you took their mask off because their design was so unique. Plus, even like in the first and second, the actors just their physicalities and whatnot between them, you would be able to tell them apart of like, oh, that's definitely Don, or like, oh, that's definitely Raphael. And the, all of the voice actors, I, I assume Leonardo's voice actors still around they're all still around i don't know if people want to hire Corey feldman anymore unfortunately he's still always donatello to me but um you could you could do that like the the voices are there and just do the same designs as the first movie don't stop fucking making it your own just do what we love do do (laughs) do your own thing with the cinematography and the directing and the right why leave the designs alone why did jim henson um back out for the third one was it money was it like the um scheduling conflict you know what i actually don't know i didn't realize that I, I, i'm not deep in the trivia on the third movie. so it makes you wonder if jim henson continued on would the story still have been the same mm. or was yeah, it like changed? would we regard three the same as the first two yeah because three is so radically different that it almost doesn't fit the same continuity you know it grew on me over time where it's like i used to say i disliked the movie now I don't, I won't necessarily go back to it the way I do for one and two, but it's like, it's, I'm not going to ignore its existence. I learned this today that, um, I don't know why I didn't know this, but Seth Rogen actually and Evan Goldberg, their company is developing an animated movie. Like an, they're, so the Michael Bay movies came out in 2014 and 2016, so two years apart, but nothing since then. So I think it's safe to say that iteration is like not continuing i haven't heard anything about it and this is the only thing that's in development they're actually writing or i don't know if he's they're writing it but he's you know producing it developing it so he came out and said he wants to i guess to no surprise uh highlight the teenage part like he thinks like them being teenagers isn't as expounded upon i guess in the visual show slash movie iterations and wants to so what they're gonna have acne and want to watch porn or something like (laughs) horny playing games pissing off splinter yeah like i i feel Uh, like the way that they had them set up was like a mature 18 year old kind of teenager you know mikey being the youngest but still like it was I don't think that's a nail that has to be driven home. I think they showed, I think they showcased that enough for what they were going for in the first movie. They were very, uh, I mean, Mikey especially, but even Leonardo, like in how his relationship with Raph was very teenage and immature and like how they argued. And plus it's like they're, they were teens. It was just teens that grew up under a, a stern father with martial (laughs) arts as their thing. So it's like, yeah, they're and teens, they're but of course freaks. they're going to be like, <laughs> I don't know, a little more uh, composed <laughs> than what they would expect. Ten flips now. <laughs> <laughs> One. One. Oh, such energy is wasted. I wouldn't mind seeing them maybe being a little more cynical about just humans and like, because they live outside of culture, essentially, and obviously they have a viewpoint because a super objective viewpoint on people because they're not people and, but they're as intelligent as us and much more skilled in martial arts. Um, but yeah, so that take is, that's like, just like still announced. I think it's like very like early on in its development. So we have yet to see, I'd assume it's going to be like the 2012, I think, uh, TMNT, which was completely CGI animation, will probably be the same way. I which really, I so still want to see the where practical, they go. But I know the two of them have surprised me before. Like when they did Preacher, I loved AMC's Preacher, and then they did uh, they're doing the Boys, and I love the Boys. So it's like, okay, you got my uh, price of admission. I'll check out whatever you're doing. Yeah, there's a good chance they'll hit. They'll try to bring in as much as possible. Like, I'm sure he wants the Turtles to grow up with him if he is a fan. 
So hopefully that aspect of it. I don't know to a degree because like they get a little. You edgier. don't want things to change either. Like it's not the turtles I grew up with. They're now older. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, like every time you know I get tired of this shit with like constant Spider Man reboots and Batman reboots. It's like just when like you're kind of getting comfortable with this one. Like another one comes out in like two three years, and then like now you have to get used to this guy, and like the last. Michael Bay won. I don't care at me all day. I liked it only for the fact that if you watched it thinking this was like a combination of Secret of the Ooze in the original um, cartoon series, it made so much more sense. Don't look at it like it's a sequel to that trashy one that came out before it. That one, I it really was like mediocre at best, not good. But this one, if you thought of it more of like along the lines of it being campy, meant for kids, meant for, you know, having that like old school nostalgia with the cartoon show, especially, I felt it worked because they did retcon a lot of stuff in the second one to make it work. Like Shredder was completely different. Yeah, well, the Shredder in the first movie is one of the worst is they obviously were like, oh, shit, fans. Oops know that we're <laughs> that we have a, we have a white shredder coming in that has nothing to do with japan that is a perfect <laughs> like, example of my argument before with like if you're a fan of street fighter please tell me you know how to do a hadouken because i feel like yeah i'm a fan of tmnt i really like them like all right well do you know who splinter is have you do you know what a splinter is you know the dad <laughs> a splinter who's your perfect a rokusaki yeah. oh william fichter easily yeah of course <laughs> Like, I don't expect you to tell me, like, on what page of the original comic does, like, Baxter Stockman make his first appearance. But for God's sakes, man, like, can you at least do a little bit something different with the way that you handled that first movie? Yeah, I it, it, it's it's a property that's near and dear to mine and a lot of it's it just it says the fan syndrome. I mean, it's like you, you, you're trying to please. A general audience and people that love it, which has been successfully done with lots of properties. But I don't think since the first movie has it, and arguably the second movie, I can argue, uh, you know, I, I don't have as much affinity for the second one as I do the first one. But I think at the end I, of the day, I, I, I prefer the second one. I'll fight you on that. I mean, um, it's in my head, it's like a, a hundred versus a 99. Yeah. I guess I think. Objectively, if somebody doesn't know what the turtles are, uh, watch the 1990 movie. I think somebody could still, as an adult, like think this is a, a solid movie. Well, you're also comparing enjoyable. I movie. feel you're comparing Alien to Aliens. They're just two completely separate genres of movie. Yeah, because the first one is more of a drama and um, thriller, I guess. With the, you know, the subtext of it being a martial arts movie, whereas the second one is clearly a comedy. Yeah. Right. With vanilla eyes. Ninja Rap is born. Ninja, ninja, rap. Ninja, ninja, rap. Ninja, ninja, rap. Go, 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 go. go ninja, go, ninja, go. Go, ninja, go, ninja, go. Um, <laughs> yeah, we could, I, we could wax on. I mean, all these topics could be their own episode, so. <laughs> Turtle wax on. Hey guys, check this! Wax on, wax off. Wax on, mouth off. Um, but I'll I'll stop talking about it because uh, we could just keep going. But yeah, it that's it is going to be rebooted again. And now as an animated movie, but I wish they would do. I just, you know, I just I just movie. I think they still could. I like Seth Rogen and the other guy a lot. I just I really hope they treat it with respect because i don't want sausage party to be in this either either you know like you know they can slip in some cursing but like i can only take his stoner type comedy so much and like just respect the material and i'm I'm good with it i guess if i do expect he will be able to do that i hope so uh, i'll give him the benefit of for it. anybody who doesn't watch it or haven't watched it you should check out their other stuff, Preacher, because that's also like I actually ended up liking their take on the show better than the comic because it was a property that I never really had much love for. And then I saw that and it's like, OK, well, now I'm into it. So that's I think the big thing is finding like especially like the upcoming Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles thing. 
you want to find something that you can change to make your own so it's distinct as far as like this is my movie this is my take on this property but i feel like you don't want to change the core elements of what people liked in the first place because i feel like changing the okay well we're going to come up with like a new villain or we're going to like throw them into some things that have never happened before that's great but you don't want to necessarily change like the the core of the characters because yeah at that point why are you even doing this why don't you just come up with a new property because you've already kind of changed around what made us like follow along with these characters for our entire lives. So right, why did you make Joker and not just a here's a here's a crime thriller? thriller. Got, yeah. yeah, exactly. Why is it Joker? Just make a couple different changes and avoid all that stigma. Yeah. So okay, so that's a, a good number one, which brings us to. Nick's number one. So I don't like theatrics, so I'm just going to say Cowboy Bebop. I think it's time we blow this scene. Get everybody in the stuff together. Okay, three, two, one, it's jam. <laughs> I'm seeing Tim's reaction Uh-oh. on uh, on um, her webcam. Now... Here. Is it reboot? Like you want to see more, or is it like I didn't like this? I want to. I want better. more. It's okay. Because like, I was gonna say, I know, <laughs> like you and I have been. It's been twenty years since we've had anything, and it's a great story. And I don't know a single person that doesn't like it. If they don't like it, it's because they just don't like the genre of space stuff. So, if this is so great, why can't we have more? I okay. will say that I. Whenever it came on on Adult Swim, I skipped it, but because that's because I've never been in, I've never tried to really get into anime. Is it, you would consider it an anime? It is. Yeah, it is no. an anime. I think that's okay. the big stigma behind it is people will overlook it when I've recommended in the past because it's like, yeah, I don't watch anime. It's like, okay, well, just if I were to say it's an animated show and not say it's an anime show, would you be more apt to have watched it? <laughs> I would definitely give it a shot. Like, I know it's super revered, um, but I guess with any anime, I would just have to be recommended and like, give me a, give me a, the starters list to anime. It's a very mature uh, I'll, show I'll check it as out. well. It's not like it has any of that. How can I put this delicately? It, it's not any of the trappings that have become stereotypical when people think of like anime. It's that not is the like, most delicate way I could have put it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like the, like big eyes and all like very over exaggerated animations and things (laughs) hey i like don't fuck with sailing moon um let's see again i don't know nothing (laughs) sorry but um yeah so i think a lot of people have a certain thing in their head when they hear that word but it's the animation is fluid it's terrific the music is one of the like my favorites I think like Nick would agree on all these points. Like it's, it it elevates itself so far above just an animated show that it would get off a list of like top animated shows and be able to sit among just top shows. Yes. So all it is, is it's set in the far future and it's just, um, it follows a bounty hunter on his ship and it just follows him and his crew through different um, adventures that occur. Cowboys, four bounty hunters, four hearts, four notes. Following a dusty trail of money, sin, and desperation. Living day to day, dreaming hour by hour. Four beats, four parts of a movement. Mars to Venus, Callisto to Ganymede. Bounty to bounty and outlaw to outlaw. One ship, one crew, one destiny. Cowboy Bebop. There is a overarching story that happens but it's very i almost want to say it's very mandalorian without grogu and mission of the week yeah 
So, like, you have, like, imagine the whole Grogu storyline, except he is not front and center because um, Spike, the main character, does have a demon that he's trying, not literally, it could be literally, but he does have, like, this big backstory that he is trying to address through the whole arc of the entire story, but it's not front and center at all, and you almost kind of forget about it periodically because it's really him just trying to make enough money to get his next meal. Uh, listen, Jed. This guy's a major player in the Syndicate, operates all around the asteroids. You said bell peppers and beef. His name's Asimov Solenson. Are you listening to me? There's no beef in here. So you wouldn't really call it bell peppers and beef, now would you? Yes, I would. Well, it's not! It is when you're broke, all right? What happened to the million Wulong reward we got for that last guy? The repair bill for that cruiser you wrecked. And the one from that shop you trashed. And the medical bill from the cop you injured. Kill the doe! And that's really it. And then along the way, he does meet a couple of new people that end up joining his crew. And that's really what, like, those first couple of episodes are. And it includes their story arcs and just kind of goes into their um, background and all that. But really, it's just kind of like, yeah, like Monster of the Week or just like... It's a very serialized thing. You can almost pick up any of the episodes in the one ser- the one season run. You can just watch that one and like that's that's it. Watching all of them in order probably gives you the most out of it, but you could pretty much watch like the 8th episode and only watch the 8th episode and you'll still greatly appreciate it. You won't be lost and you can easily figure out like, well, this is Spike, this is the main character and, you know. At least I thought so, right? I like how in the first episode, even, I think it was yeah, Asteroid Blues. So they, it's not a case of they start the series of here's this guy and then you kind of get introduced to him and then he kind of starts meeting. It's just they kind of drop you in the middle of him and his partner have already been doing this for years. They already have a history together. He's already in the middle of doing stuff. So I like how you're just immediately thrown into this universe and it's just yep. let it kind of surround you at this point it just a, a great aesthetic for the the show overall which even the movie that they ended up doing knocking on heaven's door um i think it takes place like i want to say during like episode 21 22 so it's it takes place before the series finale but i always liked having the movie because i think it holds up to the series in terms of quality um just as well so i actually don't think i've seen the movie I don't remember. We watched it at Doug's house. We did? Yeah. You were, I think, was it um, the new Galaxies thing where you can now fly ships? I think no. it had just come out. Tim, I didn't, wa- I didn't so, watch the movie then. <laughs> so I was watching Cowboy Bebop the movie with my brother on Doug's couch while you guys were huddled around the PC trying to get everything set up to do that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't even rem- if you want to do... Put a pin in the exact timeline of our life where that happened. Wow, that's, uh, I missed that. Yeah, so for anybody out there that needs to figure out that timeline, you could probably look up when that became available in conjunction when uh, Jump to Light Speed. Bebop Knocking on Heaven's Door was available on DVD. <laughs> Jump to Light Speed is the name of the expansion. At me all Dino. day when, if you want to talk about that one. <laughs> So, Dean, I know you said you have no experience with, like, usually anime for the most part, but uh, specifically Cowboy Bebop. Is that something you think you would give a shot to? Oh, I would absolutely give it a shot. Yeah. Because I've been meaning to rewatch it recently, and I think it would be fun to set up, like, a a once a week or something. So we just, when you watch it, I'll watch it. And then that way we can just chat about it at some point. Yeah, I'm down for that. Well, they're like 20 minute episodes, right? 22. Uh, yeah, like uh, 21, 22. Yeah. I, as you guys know, I've been heavily getting into the action figure scene, action figure collectibles. Um, there's a company called The Loyal Subjects that uh, just re- started releasing like a, I think they're like four inch, uh, five inch scale figures. <laughs> I'm trying to figure <laughs> for out. For the listener at home, Tim is. <laughs> Using his fingers to approximate five inches. Um, they put out... I picked up... They have a Gandalf I picked up. They have a Napoleon Dynamite. A Lightning from 
uh, Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> but these other ones I did not pick up because they're not my thing. But they have Spike and Vicious as well from Cowboy Bebop. Ooh, nice. If there was ever like a Toy Story movie of your house, I would watch that in a second. Who's our main characters? Uh, Gandalf, Lightning. <laughs> it's like that one clip from Indian in the Cupboard. <laughs> yeah. Sub Zero's trying to freeze T Rex. Um, but the uh, the group that I'm a part of, I know some people. I, I posted that I saw these were releasing, and I was like, "Hey, these, these," and they're like, "Hey, yeah, but yeah, but, but what about those Cowboy Bebop ones?" I'm like, "Oh, I guess, yeah, here they are." But it's just to say that I know it's a very fiercely loved show and revered anime. So yes, long way to say I will check it out. With Think of any closing items on Cowboy Bebop? No. <laughs> I was reading my notes. So any, anybody out there that wants yeah. to just chat Cowboy Bebop with Nick and I, feel free to, to add us. I will do that all day. I can do this all day. So start start our side podcast. Another another thread of podcasting about cow, watching Cowboy Bebop. Hey, I actually, Nick, let's get <laughs> Dean to watch each episode. We'll do one. We'll do like a 20 minute <laughs> podcast um, per episode. And we'll just call it uh, See Someday. You Space Cowboy, a Dean Fisher Cowboy Bebop podcast. So. Um, <laughs> so my number one movie that I feel would make use of a remake or reboot. Um, I don't know where you were in August 1st, 1997, but do you guys remember the movie Spawn? Oh, yes. The vi- I'm the <laughs> violator. <laughs> His face, a mask of courage. Who are you? His armor. Awesome hardware. A living weapon. His mission. Ah! A fight for justice. I call the hero. His name, Spawn. Let's get it over with. You can fire or they can back. Spawn, rated PG-13, starts Friday. Special advanced screening Thursday. Check newspapers for listing. I like that movie a lot. That's one of my cult favorite ones that, like... That's Michael, uh, Michael... Michael J. White? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Which I Spawn. liked Spawn. I didn't, like... My parents saw the trailer and said, like, you are not watching this. So I didn't get to watch it for years. <laughs> and then when I saw it, it's like, I still thought it was cool. I enjoyed it. I just want more of it but a little less of the like i love john Leguizamo, but the whole the violator character and whatnot and the clown and everything i wasn't a a huge fan of those portions but i love the whole kind of aesthetic of um al simmons like becoming spawn and all this stuff of the kind of very dark gritty top world and then going down into all the hellscapes and things like that of uh hell and then kind of coming back, the effects on the cape and whatnot, I always thought were cool. So for anybody unfamiliar with Spawn, if you um, weren't around in the 90s. So th- this was originally, it was a Todd McFarlane comic. So it starts off with Al Simmons, played by Michael Jai White. He's a CIA operative. He ends up doing a mission at a North Korean weapons depot. Um, that turns out to be a setup by his boss, played by Martin Sheen, um, playing Jason Wynn. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so um, he ends up having his henchman, uh, Jessica Priest, which I think in the the comics, it was a character, Chapel, um, who was eventually part of the Youngbloods, but they couldn't use it because it was created by Rob Liefeld. So it was this whole thing. So pretty much they had to use a different character to kill him. So they had, um, I think it was played by Melinda Clark from Return of the Living Dead Part 3. So she assassinates him. He dies. He's dead. Great. Goes to hell. Um, and then he ends up breaking up in hell, makes a deal to lead uh, Malbolgia's army in hell if he could return to the living world, see his wife. And then hilarity ensues, and he learns how to use the necroplasm armor hilarity. Uh, to fight crime. And Malbolgia is also hell. the proxy so, for Satan. Yes. So, I mean, it, it was really cool for me to kind of see it was the around the time that we're getting stuff like Batman and Robin Batman forever and then you get spawn and it's oh I felt cool like spawns the gritty superhero that I've been waiting for I would love to see rated superhero like I would love to see more of that now because I feel this would be a great property for them to do justice with modern CGI effects and things because some of the stuff like the hellscapes towards the end and like the violator creature don't necessarily hold up um, like in comparison to nowadays. So it's I feel it would really benefit from it. And also it's just 
a ton of lore that they'd still be able to make use of that it would be cool to see now, which of course I'd still love to see Michael J. White. I'm always happy to see him pop up anywhere. Um, go watch Black Dynamite. So like I, I'm mm. I'm a fan of anything that um, they would tack him back onto. I know right now I think Todd McFarland is supposedly working on his own Spawn movie, but that's been talked about for ages. Supposedly they're finally ready to film it in this this past summer, but there hasn't been any news in ages. So I I don't know how that's ever going to happen. That's his cash cow. Um, He's going to try to milk that I, as often as possible. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like it's so I think originally um, the whole thing was he wanted more creative control over the movie that they did. And pretty much the studio was like, no, we just want to buy the rights from you. So his argument was like, I'll sell you the rights for a dollar if I can retain merchandising rights and I can have creative input. Buddy, on the Star movie. Wars already came out. That ain't never going to happen. Well, I guess he did. I guess that's what happened. He ended up. So that's why we have like all the Todd McFarlane toys and the spawn. That's why they sell them for like 40, 50 like, bucks a pop. <laughs> I mean, I never bought them, but like there I, I know bought one like I've always heard about them. I know Todd McFarlane. I think he did others. Yes. Like, I was just about to say spawned other um, figures, but he, he went off into no other more ones. puns. <laughs> <laughs> it went off into other things like I think the Todd McFarlane toys did like a Clive Barker Hellraiser series of toys and like all sorts like of Alice stuff. Alice in Wonderland um, fits so, his like fucked up kind yeah. of art style. A- yeah, aesthetic. <laughs> like McFarlane toys does a lot of DC now. They they're big in the they branched out as far as the toy line. Yeah, because I know a lot of properties. Growing up, I always just thought of them as like that niche darker toy line of. These right. aren't the ones that my parents are going to buy me so I can like play with action figures in my uh, in the living room. Like these are the ones that you buy because, oh, I'm a Clive Barker fan and I'm going to put it up on a shelf kind of stuff. The ones you get at, you get at Sam Goody and Suncoast Video. Yeah. Or in the That's where you got those. Or uh, I think I just always remember them in a, a case at Clockwork Comics in Orange, Connecticut. There so. too. I actually got a spawn. Side note, I... I, I was into action figure collecting in high school and then dropped off until for 10 years or so until this year, I didn't really collect anything, but I, I, I think I liked the spawn movie a lot and I love, I think there was a PlayStation yep. game. There were several uh, PlayStation games. PlayStation game. Yeah. I think there was a, there was a PS2 fighting game that I, it was definitely a 3d like spawn game, like a, you know, third person action kind of game. I forget what it was for, but in any case, that was kind of a mini sp- spawn fan but only based on the movie because i didn't read the i didn't i wasn't a comic book kid but i had a i did have i think he's in a closet in mom and pop's attic is up back home i'll have to ship him out here sometime it's pretty cool little figure send us pictures i'd be interested to see it yes does anybody remember the the um soundtrack album they did for this movie can't say I remember that. You should definitely Google it. Um, it's where they took a bunch of like rock and metal bands from the 90s and paired them up with house electronica industrial bands. So it's like you have, um, oh God, what is it? I think it's like Metallica and DJ Spooky um, <laughs> doing like nothing else matters. It's, um, I know, I know Corn. I want to say Korn Filter. And, yeah. Uh, Kick the PA, I think was their song. Like Incubus is on it. Um, the Prodigy, um, Dust Brothers. So it's like all these weird mashups. I only really liked, I think, like two of them myself. Um, but it's just a time capsule into the time that was the mid 1990s. Um, so worth a, a Google oh, the, or Spotify. I would just say that the first song that came up, Trip Like I Do by Filter and the Crystal Method, that's a great song. That, yeah, like that's the one off the album that I like. And I, Figured like I didn't listen to it at the time, and then years later I went back to try to find it, and I found it on Spotify. I figure I'll go through, give it a shot, see what it is. Heard that, and I was like, "Oh, I love it!" Click favorite. Then it got to the next track, and I was like, "Nah, next track." Nah. Actually, I kind of <laughs> lied. It's not so much I don't remember because I didn't actually grow up with it, but it was a recent thing that I remember. You had it on like background noise. I'm like, "Why is this a corn song?" But I've never heard of this before. And then I checked and it was the Spawn soundtrack <laughs> and I actually was pleasantly surprised on how good it is. I have a very niche, like, I like what I like and I don't really budge from that. 
and all of those kind of hit all the marks that I like. So it made its way into some of my playlists. Like it's unique there, enough that so it's fun. With you on that. Dean. I would just say I'm, I'm there with you on that, yeah. on that kind of music. I mean, I, I have a, I would say I have an, a very eclectic taste nowadays, but I still enjoy that. So yeah, overall I would say, Oh, also this goes back to my thing I mentioned before the score for the movie spawn, the actual non, uh, filter Dust Brothers Marilyn Manson score was uh, Graham Revel who did Street Fighter. So back again. <laughs> Can't get rid of Street Fighter. So as far as any of those, do you guys have any final thoughts on Spawn or just any final thoughts on any of those? Ones I we almost discussed? said Short Circuit instead of Cowboy Bebop, but Short Circuit is stuck in the 80s and I don't think we'll ever be able to translate to modern society. <laughs> no disassemble mr number five. Oh yeah actually i forgot do you guys have any honorable mentions that almost made the cut yeah short circuit was mine do i i don't think so i had I, oh go ahead team no 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 i i, I wasn't gonna say anything. i was gonna say i had four had but four? i really like originally originally my number two bounced between um lucio falci's the beyond which was like a um 70s horror because it was one of those things where it's like beloved in the community i like the movie but i feel the it's the whole thing of like a woman finds out that in the the basement or something that the hotel was built on a mouth to hell so like all this stuff starts happening and then the end just gets into weird, surreal territory of like the gate to hell opening. And I thought it was like cool and I would love to see it redone now with take it even further. But like at the end of the day, Street Fighter beat it out. So <laughs> <laughs> and then I had Are You Afraid of the Dark that I wanted them to bring back just because I feel like kids oh. need more horror shows. And it had like yeah. a lot of cool stories. And I was looking into it and I guess they after they did the three episode mini movie. Um, this past year of like the Dark Carnival or something, they decided to reboot it. And next year they're doing a full season with a new, the, like the new kid cast from the movie as the new Midnight nice. Society. So that would be cool. That would be cool. That yeah, was, like, the, that was oh. the only horror I could handle as a kid, like <laughs> Nickelodeon daytime horror. Well, I guess it was on eight o'clock at night. It was, uh, yeah, night, it was so. uh, Saturday nights. Yeah. The big or was a big orange couch. Um, Those are a big part of childhood. That or Goosebumps. I didn't think Goosebumps was scary. Goosebumps right. was our. No, I mean, I definitely Are You Afraid of the Dark was the scarier of the two, but Goosebumps just was like horror light for me as Goosebumps a child. Goosebumps had a lot of uh, uh, twists, like um, oh, what the hell's the director? Shyamalan. Yeah, how much Shyamalan twists? The um, um, as opposed to horror. Very quick. The other two I had was The Crow which I don't want to remake, but I want to reboot because I feel like that. Haven't they talked about doing that one? I think they have for ages, but like, I don't want like a direct-to-video sequel deal. Like, give me like a, a reboot to the thing. Well, not a reboot to the thing. Give me a reboot to The Crow. Um, and I'll Is be... The Crow... Is he undead? I don't, I don't think I ever like saw the, the movie. It's kind of like the painting of Dorian Gray, but it's with a crow. At least the way the movie oh. projected yeah, it, so, so that he's immortal. But if the person was smart enough to attack the bird instead, that would inflict damage. But overall... Yeah, but the whole thing kicked off with him dot yeah. getting murdered, and then he okay. rises back from the dead, and now all of a sudden like that mystical crow is with him. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I was a too young when I saw that movie, maybe not even the whole thing. So just flashes of it. The um the last one I don't think you guys will know was a 1978 TV Halloween special called Witches Night yeah. Out. Um <laughs> with voices by like Catherine O'Hara, Gilda Radner, and Mr. Boogity. The uh well, <laughs> Mr. Boogity <laughs> is perfect as it is. So the whole thing was um like it's a witch in town and she a bunch of kids end up deciding they want to be scary for Halloween. So she turns them and their babysitter into their costumes um, like a werewolf and whatnot. And they have fun. But then a bunch of schmucks in town get a hold of her magic wand and start like turning things into other things. So it's like this whole wacky thing that ends with the a 1970s cartoon moral of the story. Um that she's a witch in town, but she's not a bad person, and she turns everybody back and then decides that everybody can get turned into whatever they want for Halloween. That way they can all enjoy not being themselves for one night. But I feel like that's 
that would be fun to do as like maybe a live action or something now, just because I feel when I was growing up, there were so many around Halloween, like so many TV specials or so many like movies that would pop up specifically around Halloween that we don't really have now. Or if we do, so many of them are just run of the mill, like churned out for all of the 30 days well, of Halloween. In fairness too, I feel like our finger is not on that same pulse as it used to be anymore. Cause it's not like I actively watch Nickelodeon or the Disney channel. Or whatever the hell kids watch yeah, nowadays. Uh, like, I have no idea. And, like, and I'm not TikTok. talking about, um, <laughs> like, the the super kiddie stuff, like Paw Patrol and, like, all of the other shows that younger children force their parents to watch. But, I mean, like, when the children are at an old enough age where they're just watching TV on their own and you're not supervising them all day. You know, the parents, shout out to the parents that have seen Frozen, like, a thousand million times. I'm not a parent, and I've seen yeah, it. Right. I've seen time. it once. That's how I saw Predator. Mmm. He had a VHS copy of uh, <laughs> that Silver Bullet, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one and two. All of these were taped off HBO. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and my three older sisters were my gateway into two adult for me movies at the time. So yeah, those were those were my honorable mentions um, that didn't quite make the cut. We'll post ours on uh, social media when we think of them. And also, so I don't know if you guys have any other uh, thoughts for the topic before we we wrap it up here. In terms of? No, I've said my pieces. I could go back and keep talking. I'll just keep talking. So I, I know, right? I mean, we had a 45-minute <laughs> digression <laughs> talking specifically Marvel and DC. I mean, if we needed to, there is plenty more material we can come up with. <laughs> It's going to just be our 24-hour uh, podcast stream. We'll do it for the, the one-up charity. charity. Yeah. We should do that next year. Just get a bunch of guests lined up and then just do like a 24-hour podcast. Just bring it on like a charity show. Um, okay, so that wraps up another episode of Rule of Thirds. We'd like to thank you for coming along just kind of for the ride and discussing the movies, shows we feel might benefit from a remake or reboot. So as always, you can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, no spaces, or shoot an email over to ScreenRefresh at gmail.com. Just to let us know what the top three might have been for you guys or just any topics you want to hear us discuss. Um, we're always open to kind of hearing some other things and seeing what other stuff you might want to uh, be interested in seeing a top three list made. So this is Tim for Nick and Dean. Have a great week and catch us next on Screen Refresh the first Monday of the month for an undisclosed movie. Just closing it right now before they turn the episode off. What is the no, movie? I, won't. I don't even know it. <laughs> it's a surprise for everybody. I'm going to go live without knowing what the next movie is. Good luck, everybody. Oh, the uh, next week we're going to, or the, the first of the month, we're going to be releasing. <laughs>